would you decide? You first, first. How would you decide? Well, interesting question. I don't know. 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 Hey everybody! Welcome to Dapper Dinosaur Journal Club. I don't I don't know if this is going to be like a thing. Um, I think it's my second time going over a crazy paper on the channel. Uh, the first time I did it was pre-recorded with Dr. Dan, and we did um, a study by a Muslim trying to prove that flies have a cure for diseases on their right wing and diseases on the left wing, which is uh, they failed to do that. They failed to even approach doing that. Uh, but today we're going over a paper about Archaeopteryx by Gabriella Haynes, who is Dr. Gabriella Haynes, who is AIG's uh, pet paleontologist, and of course I have with me, as is pretty typical now on Saturdays, Vishanti, how are you? Well, I've been bivalently COVID boosted nice. and flu shotted, and unexpectedly the flu shot is kicking my butt. Yeah, yeah, it, it can be rough. Well, <clears throat> I don't want to stand on ceremony for this, so let's let's uh, let's get into this. So, take a look here. This is the paper we're taking a look at. This is from the Answers Research Journal. This is by, like I said, Dr. Gabriella Haynes, published September fourteenth, twenty twenty-two, Answers Research Journal edition or volume fifteen, I guess probably. Um, and it was if you actually had the print, it was on pages two eighty-five to three hundred. But I mean, they have. A website for free and download this isn't even pirated this is all above board this is perfectly legal access to this so um talk a little bit about uh dr gabriella haynes so uh first we have a 499 super chat from vandalia 1998 uh is it a bird maybe is it a bilateral vertebrate tetrapodal archosaur yes uh, yes it is all of those things um so dr gabriella haynes is a fairly recent addition to like the aig staff um and we over at like you know the science friends we're having we're trying to look into like who is this person where is she like does she have a real degree is it in actually paleontology turns out yes she has a degree from um one of the federally administered universities in brazil i don't remember which one um it was a little hard to find because it was under her maiden name yeah we did confirm is a real doctor of real paleontology you know so this is a paleontologist we're talking about here which means as we're going to see she should know better that's that's the bad news here. There's all the good news, which is well, like, you know. Preconceived agendas are yeah. a hell of a drug. So the first thing I actually want to talk about is not even the paper. It's this picture here, which is the uh, the um, Creation Museum Archaeopteryx reconstruction. We're going to actually switch over to here where I have it open as I, its own image. Um, Pretty birdie. So, yeah, here's one thing. I actually kind of like this model. It looks really nice. I like the colors. Um, the extensive feathering is probably accurate. Uh, the colors themselves are actually probably not accurate. Archaeopteryx probably wasn't bright and colorful. Most birds aren't. Um, but there's a couple things. Now, this one bit that I'm going to talk about, it's not really their fault because when this was made, this was before this was really well established, but Archaeopteryx should probably have hind limb wings. There should be flight feathers coming from the, uh, the legs projecting backwards. Because um, basically, given the other flying dinosaurs around at the time and uh, similar to it, it probably would have had four wings. Um, but that's a fairly minor thing. And like I said, that's kind of forgivable because that, you didn't know that at the time, right? No one was drawing Archaeopteryx like that. No one was reconstructing Archaeopteryx like that at the time. So fair enough. I um, just like it because it has coloring that looks like a Quetzal. So it's very Yeah, pretty. that is nice. I mean, look, yeah. from an aesthetic standpoint, I like this model. I mean, that minor inaccuracy that I get is, is forgivable aside. I, that's perfectly fine Archaeopteryx from my standpoint. Um, I also like that they went with the, the sort of uh, fingers that look a lot like the, the toes on the leg. I think that's reasonable. Um, but here's another thing. It has raptor claws, which is weird. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so the thing, it's weird, but only because this is AIG, right? If a normal museum were um, making this model, I would actually find it very reasonable for it to have raptor feet. And the reason for this is because the exact relationship between Deinonychosauria and Aviale, which is the, Aviale is sort of like birds broadly defined, 
So it's basically anything that's more like a bird than, like, say, Velociraptor, basically. Um, is contentious. And some people say that Aviale split off right before Deinonychosaurus splits into um, Dromaeosauridae and Troodontidae. There are other studies that recover Aviale as a sister group to Troodontidae within Deinonychosauria. Um, I don't think I've seen any that suggest that birds are sister to Dromaeosaur and uh, Troodontidae is basically branching. But basically, those three, those three groups, um, Dromaeosauridae, Aviale, and Troodontidae, they're all kind of swapping back and forth because they're so similar. It's very hard to tell the difference. Which means that the big claw is reasonable. But the thing is, the Creation Museum also depicts Dromaeosaurs as leathery, lizard-like dinosaurs. So why would they then give this bird those feet and then still stick with, but it's totally not a dinosaur, you guys, seriously? Well, it's pretty obvious to me, and I don't know if it's just because I spent so long being a young Earth creationist, but the answer is reasons. Yeah, I mean, probably. <laughs> now, interestingly, uh, David Menton, who is, uh, he passed away, I think, last year, almost certainly from COVID-19, while working for an anti-vax organization. So, well, very little sympathy from me, but um, he did actually come out and say that dromaeosaurs were birds, and he had, like, the most ridiculous reconstruction of a feathered dromaeosaur. He actually skipped <sighs> out on the big hypertrophy claw for Digit 2. The big raptor claw wasn't there. He also gave them a beak and no teeth, even though no dromaeosaur had a beak and they all had teeth. Uh, <laughs> he, he okay. Was, <laughs> it was the craziest thing I had ever seen, and I'm just like, I was stunned. I, I, how is this possible? So maybe AIG is, like, they think that they're, uh, like, their Deinonychus model is wrong. They think it should actually be like a bird. I don't know. They're very unclear on it. But <clears throat> enough of that. We're actually going to take a look at the actual paper. So again, Dr. Gabriella Haynes, September 14th, 2022. So this is fairly recent. What is this? Uh... Yeah, okay. Wait, so uh, we'll just start in. Uh, Archaeopteryx has been one of the most studied fossils since its discovery in 1861. Yeah, yet this classification of the species is still under debate. I mean, that's true for virtually all dinosaurs. A many controversies remain regarding the feather, taxonomic classification, flight capabilities, its quote, evolution, and whether Archaeopteryx is a transitional form, a reptile with feathers, or bird. So we gotta stop there. Again, this is a trained paleontologist with a PhD in paleontology who should know that according to the standard model, which is, you know, evolutionary biology, all birds are reptiles with feathers. Because Turns out, Carolus Linnaeus, while he did most of the things he identified were, in fact, real groups, uh, sometimes some of his groups turned out to be paraphyletic. Reptilia was one of them. Reptilia should include birds. It didn't originally. So in order to make reptilia monophyletic, birds have to be in there. Um, <clears throat> this paper scope has briefly discussed the uh, later controversy because it has kept creation and secular scientists' worldview divided. Uh, the history of Archaeopteryx findings, their historical interpretations, the role of Linnaean and cladistic classification methods, and the implication of all that on Archaeopteryx classification were analyzed. This analysis demonstrates its placement as a bird is supported. Okay, so, if you want to say that Archaeopteryx is a bird and that it's not a dinosaur, what are the two things that we're going to have to define in the course of doing this? It's two big groups. Sorry, the only, like, I've got maybe one brain cell today, and <laughs> when you said that, it was like, if you want to call it a bird and not a dinosaur, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, yeah, um, in order to say that, you know, group X isn't a part of group Y, we need a good definition for both group X and group Y. So, in this paper, in order to say that placement as a bird is supported... <clears throat> Dr. Haynes needs to give us a good definition of dinosaur and a good definition of bird. Spoiler alert. Uh, no. No, she doesn't. She just doesn't even try. This paper also demonstrates that that's... Uh, that's optimistic. Uh, that the attempts to place Archaeopteryx uh, placement as a dinosaur with feathers rely on evolutionary-based cladistics. That's true. Which presents many methodological problems, which, well, we'll see if, if it does. For this reason, it should not be used in the analytical approach for Archaeopteryx or Archaeopteryx, as for any fossil, it is impossible to strip out the evolutionary bias. We oh my god, I'm sorry, that just made my head explode from the dumb. 
Yeah. It's also not a great sentence, but then again, I mean, this is a, English is a second language uh, speaker, so like, I try not to be too harsh on English well, grammar. Well, it's more just that saying evolutionary bias, like, it's impossible to strip that out. I'm like, uh, yeah. you're a paleontologist. How did you get a PhD? Oh, uh, thinking she... Thinking that it's evolutionary bias. So the thing is, I'm actually thinking about trying to read her, uh, her thesis, but it's in Portuguese, and as you and I have discussed, Portuguese is the romance language that's, like, the sec I'm second worst at in terms of reading. Like, it goes Romanian, then Portuguese. It's, <laughs> like... Well, I just, like, did she do, like, um, I don't want to call her Virginia, it's a different state name, Georgia, like, where she just told the panel what they wanted to hear, and as soon as she got her degree, she was like, nope, back to being a creationist. Uh, yeah, I think so. Great. Yep. I mean... Uh, Snelling has done that. Georgia Purdom has done basically all of the um, PhDs that are in relevant fields that AIG has. They've pretty much all done that because they collect real PhDs who have actual PhDs, but they all have like theses that do not support young earth creationism. Um, anyway, <sighs> let's see. are there institutions like aware of this? And is that something that they care about or? So, it's like, well, you did the work, so whatever. Most of the time it's you did the work, so we're not going to take the degree. Uh, basically, it's almost it's almost unheard of for a, an institution to revoke a PhD. It does happen, um, but you have to do, like, a lot of really big fraud. Um, last mm -hmm. time I remember it, it happened to a physicist who was, like, was getting all these amazing results, and he was working for, I think, for, uh, like, DuPont or something like that. And he was, like, on the fast track to get, like, a Nobel Prize or something. And then it turns out, no, it was all just nonsense. He just made up the results that people were expecting. And most of the time, just didn't even do the experiments. And he had his PhD uh, stripped. I don't remember his name. But, like, that's the kind of thing you have to do. This <laughs> writing nonsense <laughs> in a pretend journal is usually not enough. <laughs> Skelter9001 in the chat says, none dinosaur left bird. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so let's see. We conclude there is no reasonable explanation based on cladistics and its environmentological studies to support archaeopteryx placement other than in the bird group. Uh, so for those of you guys who don't know, baromenological refers to baromenology, which is a creation attempt, creationist attempt to basically use evolution to figure out where the kinds are. Um, got some problems in that if it's done with a wide enough data set, it recovers groups as quote-unquote kinds that are usually uh, not what creationists would like to see. You can use baromenology just... to put humans in the ape kind and birds in the dinosaur kind. Like, it's it's not that hard to do. This next, like, final sentence is just so dumb. Therefore, based on a biblical worldview, great, logical grounds, the anatomy of the nope. skeleton and skull, because apparently the skull isn't part of the skeleton, the presence of feathers, and following the traditional Linnaean classification, no, no reason remains for Archaeopteryx to be classified as anything other than a bird. So we're going to take, wrong. We're gonna take a quick look. Wrong. Yep. One thing that's important here is the traditional Linnaean classification. We're going to take a look at that right now. This is a scanned edition of Systema, Systema Naturae per Regna Tria Naturae. This is the second edition, I believe. Uh, which, I mean, look, there are other editions, but <clears throat> the editions don't actually change much of this definition. Um, mostly it removes the idea that birds have to have a penis. Because they don't. Most of them don't. Like ducks do, ostriches do, most birds don't. So, um, <clears throat> so we're gonna go through, and this is this is in Latin because this book was written in Latin. So we have heart, two oracles, two ventricles, warm blood, red blood. We have lungs, breathes back and forth, respirantes recipro uh, reciproque, breathes back and forth, mouth, flat. Naked, which means it has a beak in this text. Um, exerte, which means it's extended, so like it's a, there's a muzzle. It's not just a, a flat face like a, like a human would have. Um, edentule, toothless. So all right, right there, we have a problem. So with the, the heart and the lungs, right, we don't have that for Archaeopteryx, so who knows, right? That's a wash. However, we do know it didn't have a beak. And we do know it did have teeth. So already, according to the traditional Linnaean classification system, uh, no, Archaeopteryx isn't a bird. Okay, uh, so then we have penis, which again, 
Most birds don't actually have a penis at all, so it's uh, an internal structure with no scrotum. And they lay Oviparus uh, crusta calcarea, and um, lays eggs with a calcium crust, a hard shell. Uh, senses, senses, we have tongue, nose, or nostrils, um, eyes, and ears without... Um, auriculus is the, the external part of your ear, the part that's like cartilage underneath. Uh, so birds don't have that. Tegmenta, so this is the, the skin cumbering. Uh, pene incumbentes uh, imbricate. So feathers that lie flat and they're like divided. Um, like the, they have like the, barb, the barbules and whatnot. Um, fulcra, so limbs. Two feet, two wings. Again, Archaeopteryx almost certainly had four wings. So again, for several reasons here, we're not actually meeting the definition of bird per the traditional Linnaean classification system. Just wanted to, to toss that in there. I'm very proud that before the stream started that I was able to intuit what most of those words meant. <laughs> you were. I was... learned at least one and point eight link romance languages because <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. It was, it was good. <laughs> I was very pleased. Um, so yeah, Haley... thanks romance languages. <laughs> Paleologos says, it's almost like Dr. Haynes didn't know the Linnaean definition of a bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's almost <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, except it's exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's literally what happened. The thing is, look, if you're going to cite Linnaeus, maybe yeah. read him first. <laughs> just, yeah. just, you know, it's, it's not actually very hard to find a copy. You can even find it translated into English if your Latin isn't good. I sent you a meme on Discord. Uh -oh. And I'm I'm like frustrated that I didn't find this before the stream because we could have showed it. <laughs> um, I think I can get that onto onto screen. <laughs> oh man, you guys can tell when I'm like under rested or not like a hundred percent because I just I'm just memeing and shit posting the whole time. So <clears throat> yeah, we can get that onto the screen. <laughs> Give me one second. <laughs> Who would win? The entire Ooh, field buddy. of paleontology? One feathery boy. <laughs> nice. Okay, so um, we're actually going to go skip a fair bit of this introduction because, quite frankly, it's literally just... Let me list off every single Archaeopteryx specimen known to man. And, like, no. I, I understand there's yeah. a bunch of them. We all understand there's a bunch of them. But anyway, yeah. um, Archaeopteryx lithographica skeletal specimens and feather... Feather related to the species were found in the 19th century. They have been among the most studied fossils. I mean, guess, kind of. I'd say T-Rex is probably more studied than Archaeopteryx, but whatever. Uh, but there's so many controversial details about them. That's true. <laughs> okay, look, you find a fossil. Most of what you have is just some broken bones. In this case, you also have a lot of unbroken bones and feather impressions. But that's still not that much to go on. Of course, there are controversial details. The first uh, skeletal fossil material related to Archaeopteryx was found two years after one of the publications had shaped the scientific world. Oh, so, okay, look. Not long after Origin of Species was published. Yep, we know. Um, for some people at the time, finding Archaeopteryx seemed to offer a solution to the challenge of missing links or transitional forms, an idea essential to Darwin's theory of evolution. Yeah, because it doesn't meet the definition for a bird, but it clearly has a whole bunch of features that only birds have. So... Hmm... Uh, in the list of controversies among secular scientists are the quest to determine whether the feather belongs to that taxon. So basically, feathers have been found in the same rock uh, quarry that skeletal elements were found. And there's a question, how do we know it's actually from Archaeopteryx? I don't know the answer to that question. I also don't know why it matters to this paper. Uh, whether Archaeopteryx would be the first and youngest, i.e. in an evolutionary perspective, avian? No, it almost certainly would not be. Um, the thing is, when you first find the fossil of something, that means it's already part of a population that exists, which means it's essentially impossible for you to find the earliest thing because it would have had evolutionary antecedents that would have been very similar, but not identical to it, right? So, and also, of course, this is assuming that um, Archaeopteryx is an avian, which again, it's definitely not an avies, it's an aviale, which is a wider group. And if you want to say the bird means aviale rather than aves specifically, which is just crown birds, so it's like if you're not closer to um, like an anything outside that, then you're not technically an aves. So um, yeah, uh, also it to be resol resolved. There we go. Are its flight capabilities and how that ability quote evolved. 
Uh, yeah, that's actually an interesting point. So um, the shoulder girdle and the uh, sternum of Archaeopteryx are basically very similar to those of other Manoraptor and dinosaurs like Velociraptor or Deinonychus or Troodon, which were definitely not flying. So while it probably could flap to gain some energy, to put some energy into its ball, basically, it was probably mostly gliding. So the difference between flight and gliding is whether or not you can put energy into the glide faster than gravity takes it out. So you start up at some height, right? And that gives you potential energy. Now, when you're gliding, you're using lift to reduce the rate at which you fall vertically and extend the distance over which you travel horizontally. But as you fall, that's losing that potential energy. And eventually, when it's all gone, you're at the ground. Now, you can add energy to this whole system by doing things like flapping. But if you can't flap enough to add energy faster than it's being taken away by gravity, you're gliding. If you can, flying. That, does that make sense for everyone? Yep. Okay. Well, Vishanti, with your one working brain cell today, if it makes sense for you, then I think it's good enough. <laughs> um, I think as I get more caffeinated, then more brain cells will wake up. Yeah. Hopefully. You'll, eventually, you might even get to four. Yeah. We'll see. Or a little synapses firing off here and there. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> that is definitely the sound that nerves make. <laughs> um... Let's see. Uh, lastly, whether Archaeopteryx is a bird, a transitional form, or a dinosaur with feathers. Uh, fun fact, it can be all of those, depending on how you define <laughs> bird. That's one of the things about this paper, is it, it will say, is Archaeopteryx this or this, when it's actually a both and, not an either or kind of situation. It's like, birds are dinosaurs with feathers. It is transitional. And whether it's a bird just depends on exactly where you put birds in terms of which clade counts as what you're going to call a bird. Because Bird is a colloquial term, right? Oh, it's like saying goat, right? Exactly which animals count as goats, because goats and sheep are basically the same thing. So is that a mountain goat, or is that a wild sheep? I don't know. It's, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Oh, come on. They're both the same kind. <laughs> According to um, Answers in Genesis, not only are, are, they, are the goats and sheep the same kind, but they're different kinds from cattle, despite being in the same family and very closely related. Why? Well, you know, scientists just make up stuff and their definitions don't fit the Bible. But do you know their reasoning for putting uh, cattle and goats and sheep in different kinds? Well, yeah. Reasons. <laughs> it's literally because people kind of think that they're different, so we'll call them different. Like I said. That's reasons. it. It's just, it, it looks different to me. Okay. Because reasons. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Um, regarding that last topic, creation scientists' uh, views have been divided between two op different and opposite conclusions. Uh, one group considering Archaeopteryx as a bird and the other as a reptile with feathers, which again, that's, that can be the same position. I, feather... I, just, I keep going through that meme where it's the, the yes Chad. Like, is this a dinosaur or is it a bird with feathers? Or is yes. it a reptile with feathers? Yes. Yes, it is those things. Um, so basically, one of the things that's odd about this, right, is that as a rule, young Earth creationists accept that things like bird and reptile exist as categories, despite the fact that they don't think that the created groups of organisms that God directly made in the beginning were just like an ancestor of all reptiles or all birds or all mammals, right? They recognize that there are these patterns in animals that animals fall into while they also think that they're specially created. So they think that whales were created as mammals, and humans were created as mammals, and lizards were created as reptiles, and ostriches, say, were created as birds. But they also recognize lower down things, right? Like they don't think that primate is a kind, but they recognize that some of the various kinds, like what they'll call pongidae, which is just what everyone else calls hominidae, except they don't include humans, so that's a kind. And they'll say, um, Canidae, the, the dogs, that's a different kind. But okay, but mm. you recognize that primate and carnivora are both valid groupings, right? Like, you recognize the similarity between dogs and bears and raccoons and cats and civets that makes them all in carnivora. Okay, well, you can just say that 
bird is a group of dinosaurs, just like carnivora is a group of mammals. It's fine. It doesn't violate anything about young earth creationism at all. So it's it's a weird hill to die on. Um, anyway. And also it means that their dinosaur uh, reconstructions are just going to get less and less accurate as time goes on, as they refuse to accept the scientific evidence. Uh, let's see. Some supporters of the let... Oh, okay. Considering Archaeopteryx is a bird and others were reptile with feathers. Yep. Some supporters of the latter opinion, that it's a feathered theropod, um, seems, seem no longer to consider the classical, biological, and taxonomic significance of these two different classes, birds and reptiles. McLean and Patron Spites, 2018. However, Archaeopteryx classification will be the only controversy discussed in this paper. So, again, this is Dr. Haynes complaining that um, apparently McLean and Patron and Spites, which I think I'm saying that right, um, they're, they're ignoring the, the traditional Linnaean classification of birds. Which is a weird thing to complain about, since um, she's also ignoring it. <laughs> so, little well, it's inconvenient. Yeah, a little, a little bit of a, a, a hypocritical complaint there. Um, you can tell that they don't actually have a paleontologist on staff who could possibly have peer reviewed this. This is one of the reasons why I say the Answers Research Journal is a pretend journal. It's just for like, it's like a cosplay journal, right? It looks like a journal. Just like sometimes Vishanti looks like Wonder Woman, but I'm pretty sure she doesn't actually have an invisible jet. How would you know you can't see it? I didn't say I'm sure. I just said I'm pretty sure. Very confident. <laughs> Maybe you do. I doubt it. I also doubt that you have uh, bracers that can block bullets, despite the fact that you're basically immune to bullets anyway. Which is a right. weird, it's a it's weird thing. Braces are superfluous. Yeah. Like, why do you have those? You're immune to bullets. <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. Actually, I did see a meme where the answer was uh, because if uh, Diana lets the bullets hit her, her breasts jiggle too much. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> but also, yeah, the bracers I have are made out of EVA foam, so they are absolutely not bulletproof or even bullet resistant. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the creationist view, Archaeopteryx is a beautiful demonstration of God's created handiwork, an animal with fully, fully developed feathers. There you go. Very similar to the modern ones we see in birds today. I mean, yeah, they're basically identical to modern feathers. It's also uh, essential because its fossil record points us to the Genesis Flood, which, no, no, no it doesn't. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the, the water that Archaeopteryx is preserved in, because it comes primarily from the Solnhofen limestone. And the Solnhofen limestone is a Lagerstadt, which means it is an area with exceptionally well-preserved fossils. So... This actually is formed from very fine grain um, lime. Is it lime? Yes, yeah, limestone. Okay, so sorry, I had to a little brain hiccup there. Um, so one limestone just doesn't deposit very quickly, right? Because it's actually primarily composed of the skeletons of dead algae, which I mean you can only have so much algae in the water at a time. And also, because the grains are so fine, they take a very long time to settle, and they really only settle in very still water. The reason is, um, so sediments, basically, they, they settle faster the bigger they are, because the bigger they are, the less significant things like brownian motion or water flow are going to be on them. So for very fine grain sediments, like the stuff that goes to make up lime, um, just brownian motion, which is just, you know, the random motion of water molecules because they have a temperature, that right there is frequently enough to overcome gravity temporarily and send the, the sediment up rather than down. Overall, you know, all things tend to cancel out and gravity will win and eventually it will settle, but it takes a long time. You can see the same thing with like coffee grounds, right? So if you have like poorly filtered coffee, um, there's coffee grounds everywhere, but the big ones sink to the bottom of the cup first. And so what you're actually drinking only has the very fine like dust-like particles. And if you were to put your coffee with your coffee grounds in, say, like uh, a French press, like let's say you're going to do cold brew in a French press, right? So if you put your coffee grounds in there, you stir it up. When you go to take the coffee out and you're going to filter it, if before you filter it, you look, you'll notice the big grains are at the bottom and they get progressively smaller as they go up. Limestone, this very fine grain limestone that has to be fine grained or it couldn't preserve those feathers, has to settle slowly. We happen to know that this was an anoxic lagoon, which is why Archaeopteryx didn't rot very quickly because the only organisms that were able to successfully scavenge it basically were anaerobic bacteria and anaerobic respiration is slower than aerobic respiration so even though 
it is still being eaten by something. It's happening at much slower levels than you would expect in a, an anoxic limey lagoon. Um, which is not a flood deposit by any means. Uh, let's see. Secular scientists thus propose... Okay, there we go. Uh, Archaeops show the neck recurved, which has been demonstrated to happen in water with high salt levels. Uh, it's also been shown to happen in other places. Basically, um, there has been several hypotheses for this epistatonic posture. We actually talked about this uh, last week, Bishanti, if you remember. So, watch... Uh, did we? Yeah, have some more caffeine. <laughs> okay. We actually, I believe we actually even read this paper last week, or referenced it. We brought it up. Um, secular scientists thus proposes death by drowning Wellenhofer 2009. So Wellenhofer is one of the people who's on the side of uh, the opistotonic posture of the neck curved over the back and the tail kind of curling up over the back is a paramortem phenomenon. So Wellenhofer proposes that basically this is the result of muscle spasms and uh, neurons misfiring around the time of death. Um, the other hypothesis which I believe is closer to being a consensus, there isn't currently a real consensus on this, is that it's a post-mortem effect, which is evidenced by experiments using birds. In uh, If bird carcasses are put in water, they tend to arch like that. So it's possible that most archaeopteryx specimens were, uh, caused, were killed by drowning. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, which is a reasonable explanation that agrees with the cause of death of many animals during Noah's Flood. Uh, yes, if Noah's Flood were real, I would assume many animals would drown. This is sort of the point. Uh, but we know that this isn't a flood deposit, so... Problem there. In a catastrophic event such as the Genesis, Flood of Genesis, we would expect evidence of an elevated salt concentration in the water. I don't know if that's true, actually. Why would you expect that? There's no citation here. That's just a, a bald assertion. Um, if it's primarily from rainwater, then I would expect... Salt salinity basically be brackish. We also have things like if it's hydroplate, where there's water underneath the earth for some reason somehow, and it bursts up. I don't know how salty that would be. I don't know what the prediction is for creationism for the saltiness of the ocean. It's like there's a lot of reasons it could go either way, and there's no even attempt to establish why it should be hypersaline. Hmm. Whereas if it's in a lagoon that occasionally is cut off from the rest of the ocean, you know, things like tides and whatnot, it does make sense for there to be some salt buildup. That could make sense. Also, she hasn't actually demonstrated that Archaeopteryx specimens did die in a hypersaline env environment. She just proposed it. So, overview of the known specimens of Archaeopteryx. This is the part where we're just going to start skipping over because, I mean, it's just, look, I know that you know that there's a lot of specimens of Archaeopteryx. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll get a little bit of this. So Archaeopteryx means ancient feather or ancient wing in Greek. Uh, in 1861, a single isolated feather looking just like a modern feather was found in the southern Germany in the rocks of late Jurassic system in which all the other known remains of Archaeopteryx were found. The single feather is also known as the first fossil feather ever found. It represents the most, oh, sorry, the first fossil material found and identified as Archaeopteryx. Yes, that's true. Um, so later Herman Meyer published naming it Archaeopteryx lithographica. Uh, he called it that because uh, lithographica is stone writing, and the, the quarry it was found in was actually being used for lithographic stone, which is basically um, like when you're printing like books, you want an illustration or something in there. You usually you cut it into either wood or stone, and you can press that in, and that's the kind of thing that the, uh, the stone was being used for. And it needs to be very, very fine-grained so that you can get a lot of detail, because you can't have detail that's smaller than the smallest grains in your um, rock. So the finer the grain is, the more uh, detailed the carvings can be. Why this was being used. Uh, anyway, um, first skeletal specimens, London specimen in uh, 1861. Great. So people in 2020 thought maybe an a feather was Archaeopteryx. Maybe it's not. Who cares? 1861. Yep. Despite its formal formation in 1863. matter oh look here's a list um so this is views on archaeopteryx this is actually a little bit interesting so um this was like the beginnings of formal paleontology so people didn't really know what things were so herman Mayer in, in uh 1857 thought it was actually a specimen of pterodactylus which is weird because pterodactylus looks very little like archaeopteryx 
Uh, Friedrich Witz said it had the features of a bird and a reptile, which is true. Albert Oppel said it was a bird with a reptilian tail. Again, true. Uh, Andreas Wagner in 1861, a reptile with a feather-like body cover. I mean, almost true. It was feathers. They just were. Um, Hermann Meyer, 1861, shows difference from living birds. Also true. Uh, Carl Haberlein has a tail like a pterodactyl, which, one, okay, look. Dr. Haynes, you're trying to write a paleontology paper. Why in the word, world is the word pterodactyl in your paper? That is a, a common term for pterosaur. It doesn't even look that much like a pterosaur tail, at least not if you're going with, like, you know, pterodactyloid pterosaurs, but okay. C. Uh, Gable in 1863 thought it was an artifact, a.k.a. it was a human-made hoax, which, no, it's not. Fred Hoyle tried to make that argument, too. He was also wrong. Uh, Richard Owen in 1863 said it was a long-tailed bird. Okay, there we go. Um, and then this is just a list of different specimens. Oh, here's a fun one, though. The Eichstatt, Eichstatt specimen right here, JM2257, was actually misidentified uh, as a compsognathus and in huh. the 1970s, and it wasn't until the 80s. Um, so My Meyer here thought it might be Archaeopteryx, but it was um, formally confirmed in the 80s, and then, yeah, there was some, like, oh, maybe it's a new genus, because... Guys, everyone wants to name a genus of dinosaurs. Everyone. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, it's a thing. I think dinosaurs are a little bit, um, they're a little oversplit, in my opinion. I think that there might be a few too many dinosaur genera out there, but that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, this was actually uh, thought to be a, a compsognathus for a very long time, which is not a dinosaur, or not a bird at all. It's actually a fairly basal uh, silurosaur. So, uh, let's see, the Solenhofen specimen, blah, blah, blah. Unlike modern birds, the Archaeopteryx has some features that Thomas Huxley saw as similarities with dinosaurs. Yeah, it's just a few. Like, everything it takes to be a dinosaur. Uh, he was the first to propose the relationship between dinosaurs and birds in 1868, and almost 100 years after Huxley's position in 1969, Ostrom published his research on the fossil material found during two expeditions, one in 1931, 1932, and the other over 30 years later. In his conclusions, the new species he described, Deinonychus anteropus, was a theropod dinosaur, Dromaeosauridae, and shared many similarities with Archaeopteryx. That's true. Because of the study of Deinonychus, Ostrom propo proposed that birds were descendants of theropods and noted similarities between Archaeopteryx and Silurosaurs. Those were later described in 1991 and 1994. So yeah, this is actually the start of what's called the dinosaur revolution, right? So up until this point, even, you know, paleontologists kind of thought of dinosaurs as sort of lumbering, slow, dumb, cold-blooded beasts that were just kind of kicking around until evolution finally got around to making the superior mammals who were full of piss and vinegar and ready to go conquer the world. And then Ostrom comes up and says, hey guys, look at this. This is a dinosaur that's clearly built for speed and an active lifestyle, and it has a body <laughs> very similar to some of the ancient birds we've been finding. Maybe some of these dinosaurs were quick, warm-blooded, active animals that didn't just kind of bask in the sun until their body got warm enough for them to bother to bite each other. Maybe we should name them, like, Fast Bird. <laughs> um, like, but, I think one of them should at least be named Fast Bird. That would be nice. Uh, yeah, Velocornus, something like that. Cool. Nestle 20 has sent a super chat for five dollars with no message. Thank you very much, Nestle 20. I really appreciate it. Um, one of the views that have helped to shape the idea of a relationship uh, between Archaeopteryx and dinosaurs was propagated by Gerhard Heilmann. Uh, by the way, guys, if I'm getting these German names wrong, let me know. But I, I, my German is pretty bad. Um, so Gerhard Heilmann, author of one of the books that greatly influenced the discussion of the evolution of birds. He was a painter and an illustrator and published his book in 1926. He said that Archaeopteryx might be termed a warm-blooded reptile disguised as a bird. Um, I mean, yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. It could be described that way. Uh, following in this list of features that Archaeopteryx has and which were interpreted as shared with dinosaurs. So we're actually going to point out, at no point does Dr. Haynes describe what dinosaurs are or have in terms of their anatomy or what's required to be a dinosaur this is just listed as like a oh they, maybe these things are similar to a dinosaur i don't know dr Haynes doesn't tell me whether or not these are actually dinosaur traits or whether they're reptile traits or anything she just lists them 
Of course, it's impossible to discuss all of them since that is not in the scope of this paper. I mean, it could be. It could be Dr. Haynes. This is actually a pretty short paper. You could have just gone in depth. However, this brief, ex brief explanation presents principles from which those characteristics can be uh, seen, analyzed, and understood. List from Wellenhofer 2009 includes the presence of teeth in the jaws. That is definitely a typical thing for dinosaurs. Three clawed digits. Also a thing for dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, especially Salurosaurs, tended to have two or three fingers. Only very, very uh, primitive theropods had four. And I think if Herrerasaurus ends up being a dinosaur, sorry, not a dinosaur, a, uh, a theropod, I think it might have had like a fifth metacarpal or something. So like maybe that kind of counts. But um, Gastralia. Oh no, we skipped long bony tail. Long bony tail, and then in parentheses, Dr. Haynes puts pica style. But the problem is that a pica style is the opposite of a long bony tail. So a pica style is the clump of a few fused vertebrae at the end of a bird's tail, which comes right after a few free vertebrae that the bird can move, which is how birds can move their tail fan. And so having a long bony tail means you don't have a pica style. Having a pica style <laughs> means you don't have a long bony tail. These are not synonyms. These are antonyms. Valkyrie Vision sent a super sticker with hippopotamuses popping up out of the water for $4.99, or as I like to call them, uh, aquatic, oh sorry, aqua murder cows, because uh, yeah. yeah, hippos are one of the deadliest animals on earth. And yes, Nestle20 sent another super chat for $2, thank you very much. Um, JS asks if Herrerasaurus is not- Hippopotamus, dude, that's the whole Oscar <laughs> Isaac thing. That was such a great little song. So JS asks, uh, Herrerasaurus is not a theropod. So maybe. Herrerasaurus is maybe a, a theropod. It might be the basal most known uh, uh, sauropodomorph. It might also be the basal most sauriscian that actually predates the split between sauropodomorpha and theropoda. It's a weird dinosaur, and there's a lot of disagreement. And uh, yeah, I... Personally, I'm on Team Theropod, not for good reasons, but because I want that to be the case. That's it. That's the only reason I have to say that that's, <laughs> that's my preference, right? Which, look, I'm allowed to have a favorite hypothesis. I'm also, you know, beholden to tell you that I don't have good reasons for saying that that's my favorite hypothesis. Um, I don't find the people holding that position or arguing for that position to be significantly more convincing than the, you know, basal Sauriscian or uh, Sauropodomorpho types. I just like it better. Uh, okay, so we have Gastralia. So Gastralia is what are called belly ribs. Um, they still exist in uh, Sphenodon, the, uh, the Tuatara from New Zealand, which is a Rhynchocephalian, which is uh, like the sister group to lizards. Uh, well, okay, the sister group to lizards, unless Amphisbania isn't a lizard group, which it might be. See how there's open questions all over taxonomy and it's not unique to Archaeopteryx? <laughs> Um, so these, if you look at a really good dinosaur mount, you'll see these little uh, like strips of bone with a sort of like circular-ish cross section that go across the belly. Those are gastralia. They're mostly there to help uh, anchor a few muscles and give support to the organs as well as a little bit of protection. Uh, Treacheradiate palatine. So this is something that's in the roof of the mouth. And it's, I mean, I don't actually even remember how they figured out that Archaeopteryx would have this. But it is a, a dinosaur thing. Hyperextendable claw on the second toe, which is what we actually saw here with the um, the raptor feet on Archaeopteryx. So that's actually not a dinosaur thing. It's, it's specifically a Deinonychosaur thing. So, um, Look at those robber feet. Yeah. A reduced fifth toe. Um, I mean, I think it's an absent fifth toe. I'm pretty sure that Archaeopteryx only has four toes, like, you know, most birds and theropods and whatnot. Um, interdental plates, this is another thing in the jaw that we're not really going to get into very much because it's hard to show it on screen. Um, but the thing is, all of these things, except for the weird confusion with um, bony, long bony tail and pigocyle, which are actually opposites, these are all things that are present in dinosaurs, um, not modern birds, or are present in some dinosaurs, but again, not in modern birds. So, yeah. Some of those anatomical characteristics characteristics can be easily demonstrated to be shared with other birds, such as the presence of teeth in enantiornithines, extinct birds. Okay, but remember, remember, we're, we're arguing for the traditional Linnaean classification, mm -hmm. which includes this, this word right here. No, Edentulae. no teeth. No yeah. teeth. So, um, 
That's like 20 for $2 for $2 says, could I join the talk and like the video, everyone? Yes, please do like the video. It really does help. Um, I'm currently, basically, I, I need to be asked before the show starts. And by before the show starts, I mean usually a day or two before. That's my, my general rule. It's, it's, it's a bit much for me to try adding people and, yeah. At, hit me up earlier next time. Because the answer is sometimes, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, there are people I'll add to, to streams, um, but it's a little last minute for that. Um, let's see. Uh, let's do, 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 do claws in Hoatzins. Actually, lots of birds have claws. Um, ostriches, uh, emus have claws. Geese have claws. This is on their wings. Um, ducks, some ducks have claws on their wings. On their uh, like Because geese being giant meanie heads that hate everybody all the time wasn't enough. They needed right. claws on their wings. Uh, swans have claws. Swans actually will uh, slash with their claws, with their wings. They're pretty ill-tempered, too. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, they're basically just a different kind of goose. Yeah. Um, so Giraffe goose. <laughs> bony tail pigus style that is seen in, in antiornithines. So, yes, in, in antiornithines, which are in fact fossil birds, do have pigus styles, but a bony tail? What other kind of tail are we expecting here? Did dinosaurs have <laughs> boneless tails? What, what is happening boneless in this tails, sentence? Boneless boneless wings. Oh. Tasty either way. Goodness. Um, but yeah. Sorry, that's just a bony the, tail. Like, did you expect them to be made out of cartilage? Right, yeah, like what? what? In embryo, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh. the only thing that's saying the presence of teeth in an antiornithines, extinct birds, does is show that, again, you have another group of organisms that meets almost all the definition for bird from Linnaeus, but doesn't quite get there. So what's going on with that? Uh, Gastralia are shared with other groups of animals. That's true. They are a common trait in tetrapods. Mm, they were, but only present in some living reptiles. Yeah, basically, um, Gastralia are present in, like I said, the Spinodon, which is the Tuatara, New Zealand, as well as crocodilians, and the plastron of turtles might actually be Gastralia. They might actually just be fused Gastralia. We're not sure. It's... it's hard to trace, both in the fossil record, and I don't know if sufficient work has been done embryologically on turtles, or other reptiles like crocodilians that could show the homology between Australia and the plastron of a turtle shell. Plastron is the, the bottom part, the uh, ventral part. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, maybe there are Gastralia there. Uh, let's see, other features such as palatine have different but opposite interpretations. Um, yeah, Mayer and... Uh, Hole and Peters in 2005 say it's tetraradiate with four processes, which is dinosaur-like feature, but uh, you know enough Polish to say that, Vishanti? Uh, let me check. Which word are you looking at? Because I was, for some reason, not looking at the same screen. Here we go. Uh, that one. Elzanowski? 1996, see it as triradiate three processes, which is bird-like feature. This is still in dispute. Okay, fair enough. Uh, O'Connor et al. 2022 state that the studies have confirmed the condition of having teeth separated by interdental bone is typically present in most toothed birds, like Sapiornis and Antiornithines, like Pel uh, Pengornis, there you go. Which, <clears throat> okay, again, makes them not birds, according to Dr. Haynes' definition, because she's the one citing Linnaeus, not me. Other features in the above list and others not cited remind us that scientists might not fully understand these features. Yeah, there's a dispute about some of the features. Like, most of the specimens of Archaeopteryx don't even have a skull. So the exact shape of various bones in the roof of the mouth is going to be hard to figure out. It seems straight to say, but in all scientific fields and endeavors, scientists do not uh, understand everything, which is why we, there is a need to keep researching. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wow. Haynes. Wow, if that isn't a self-aware wolves moment. Right? There were, are, and will be still many situations in which conclusions cannot be immediately drawn. Yes, thank you for okay. explaining science. <laughs> that demonstrates that scientists also have fallible and finite minds in this fallen world oh as my. they try to understand the creatures created by the creator's perfect, infinite, and creative mind. I remind uh, you, this is supposed to be a science paper. Not a theology look, journal. This isn't a theology I, journal. Again, I know people have brought this up before. 
and it may seem trite to say, but <laughs> perfect creation. Please, somebody explain viruses and parasites. And which of Noah's kids had which ones on the ark? Right. But, and, and, you know, his daughters-in-law, because they were there too. Maybe like, one of them was who... the one who gave syphilis to the rest of the world after the flood. Right. It's like, where did they come from? Why are they a thing? I mean, if you want to make some bizarro case that, oh, those happened after the fall. Okay, you need to provide a mechanism for that because that just doesn't, like, spontaneously generate. Right. Goodness gracious. All right. Uh, where were we? From a biblical perspective, similarities are expected to be seen throughout God's creation because every creature has the same designer. Okay, so what Ooh. about differences? Why do birds, pterosaurs, bats, and insects have radically different wings? Is that different design, different designer? Like, why isn't there just one kind of wing that works for everything that flies? Mm -hmm. You can make the argument that insects are small enough that they need a different kind of wing, and I would say, okay, that's fair. That's fine. Okay, but bats, bats and birds. And, and pterosaurs, don't forget the pterosaurs. Yeah. Why don't they all have the same wing? Why Is feathers it... and then membranes? Like, mm -hmm. can someone please? Or there's also uh, Yi Ji, the dinosaur that had feathers and membranes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Which, that's a different kind of wing right there. Now, was it flying? Probably not, but it was probably gliding. Um, which, again, also, the fact that creationists still ask what good is half a wing when we live in a world chock full of animals that have half a wing and do just fine is bizarre <laughs> to me. It's like, Well, you can glide with it. That's what good it's for. Please observe this sugar glider. Yeah, right. It exists. Um... So, we should perceive the same designs repeated in, in different animals, therefore similarities found among different created kinds are interpreted as features designed for a purpose that, even though we might not fully understand them, are still designed by God for a reason. On the other hand, look through an evolutionary lens, those similarities arose from evolutionary history of ancestry and descent. The point is not whether yes. there are similarities, but how they are interpreted. So, one of the things is, even if we just give her all of this, right, we'll say, yep, common design, common designer, that's fine. None of that is a reason why birds aren't dinosaurs. Because again, creationists accept larger taxonomic groupings as a thing that like exists in some sense, where mammals are all, all more similar to each other than they are to non-mammals. And so God is creating within these patterns, right? That's why creationists can identify whales as mammals successfully. Okay, well, well if whales are super weird mammals, why can't birds be super weird dinosaurs? Well, Jacob Ostapovich in the chat brings up a really good point birds are birds reptiles are reptiles and then right before that uh steve reno is any type of wing objectively better in all environments that was the one i meant to read I oh okay um that one it's kind of one of those things where a creationist is going to end up arguing themselves into circles because if they want to be like no 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 god i'm immediately going to counter with the fact that according to them the earth basically had one climate before the flood because there weren't seasons or snows or anything like that. So why would you need to design for different environments? Elevation. The mountains weren't really pushed up that far, according That's to the creationists true. before I've, them. I've so... actually heard a creationist say like the highest elevation on earth before the flood was like 24 meters. Like, oh, what? I'd like to know where you got that number from. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, listen, you can't have it both ways. Like, oh, God designed them from different environments and then turn right around and say, oh, no, the Earth basically just had the one climate because, you know, summer and winter and snow and stuff didn't happen until after the flood. Like, come on, guys. Pick a lane. Yeah. yeah. It's... One of the things about creationism is that it's, it's internally incoherent in a lot of ways. You'll have the same people saying things that directly contradict each other, um, which is just weird. Um. <sighs> anyway, all right, here we go. Um, is Dr. Osiris's Klingon message coherent to you? Uh, so I'm not familiar with the with the word load because I mean shosh on its own means mother, load on its own means man or male. Uh, load I remember as being husband. So. Also, uh, you don't use the uh, previous sentence pronoun et with... Oh, no, you do, because you use har, not nech. Uh, damn it. Something word that I don't... Uh, I... Do I hate something? 
my something. Maybe mother-in-law? Going for mother-in-law with that one? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, from a biblical perspective... Oh, oh, oh DM wing. 24 meters because the flood's depth is given, and it was higher than the tallest mountain. Uh, I still am not sure how you, how you derive, then, the height of the mountains from the depth, from the difference between the, the flood and the mountains. Uh, Inkboy says, I mean, if Edwin, oh, anyway. for five euros, it says, if Edwin Starr would be a creationist, half wing, huh? Yeah? What's it good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, reptile bird alive today. The Hawatsen. Oh my goodness, the Hawatsen. Is known as a reptile bird. Is it? I've never heard it called that outside of this paper, but maybe. Because it shares features that are defined as reptilian. Does it? It also shares characteristics with mammals. <laughs> Okay, Grudge All 1995. I think we might have to find that one. Grudge All. Oh, it's it's a an H. So it's Alejandro Grajal 1995. Structure and function of the digestive tract of the Watson. Polyvorous bird with a foregut ferment. Oh. The thing it shares in common with mammals is that some mammals use fermentation to digest plants. And so does this one bird. Now, granted, no. that's not a mammal thing. World, that's not a, just a, a mammal thing, right? That's like specifically uh, ruminants, which you might also know as the kosher animals. Because mm -hmm. basically, when it comes to mammals, that is, you can just say ruminant. All the ruminants meet all the requirements. And all the requirements are met by ruminants. Um, let's see. It is called enigmatic. It is called an enigmatic creature. With an unsure phylogenetic placement? It, is it? By whom? It has claws like a reptile. No, it has claws like a dinosaur, like all birds with claws do, which is many of them. Feathers like birds. Yeah. And a digestive system like a cow. No. It has one pouch of foregut that it stores plant matter in because it's eating leaves. That It doesn't have a seven-chambered stomach. It doesn't chew the cud. <laughs> what is going on? This is terrible. This is this is just lying. <sighs> Thus it has a mosaic of shared features. No, it doesn't. The platypus is another example of such a mosaic of shared No. Holy crap. Nothing about the platypus is mosaic. It's quote unquote beak, not made of keratin, not hard struck surface. Um Oh, Paleologus says it's dapper dinosaur a bird. I am not a bird. Um, so the beak is actually just made of, of well, of the bill of the uh, platypus is just made of skin. It has electrosensors in it, so it can actually sense the electrical potential of its prey moving around underneath the mud and muck at the bottom of the ponds it lives in. Um, <clears throat> it lays eggs, but they're they only have one kind of uh, yolk protein instead of the three that are typical in most tetrapods. They hatch almost immediately because it's a mammal. Um, like, I, I don't know, it's mesothermic, so it's not quite warm-blooded, but like it's not cold-blooded either, but it's not the only mesothermic mammal. Hyraxes are in that sort of that mesothermic area too. I mean, it's just not mosaic. And you can say, oh, it has like a beaver's tail. Yeah, okay. Flat tail is not exactly like, you know, the greatest synapomorphy to judge classification by. Um, matter of classification, definitions and interpretations. Archaeopteryx has a transitional form. So here we would expect some definitions that we've been missing so far, right? Because, you know, that's the kind of thing you do. You define things. Anyway, Thomas Huxley, a supporter of Darwin and his theory of evolution, proposed in 1868 that Archaeopteryx was a transitional form. He compared Archaeopteryx with Compsognathus, Megalosaurus, and Iguanodon, and Arche Arche Archaeopteryx was a transitional form. Archaeopteryx, so sorry, Huxley ended this, his article by stating Archaeopteryx is more remote from the boundary line between birds and reptiles. Okay. This interpretation relied ha only on an evolutionary perspective. An a priori belief that animals evolved from one kind into another kind. There's another thing that we never had to find here. Kind. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny how how reticent young earth creationism is to define what a kind is and show a a technique that can separate them without then proving too much, right? Because it's 
also really unfortunate that there haven't been any developments in science since 1868. Yeah, yeah. Also, I'll, I'll note that in this entire paper, um, we don't actually get a detailed description of the anatomy of Archaeopteryx and why it points to it being a bird and why it points to it not being a dinosaur. It's literally just a literature survey where Dr. Haynes, for no particular reason other than her explicitly stated bias, comes down on the side of people who are saying it's a bird and then pretends that those same people are saying it's not a dinosaur. Because they're also saying it's a dinosaur. Um, over the years, this idea has been dis, uh, depopulated. That's a fun word. Desire to make Archaeopteryx a missing link was only to support the theory of evolution in answering the critics of Darwin's uh, proposition that missing links must exist. Thus, many scientists and people generally still believe Archaeopteryx is a transitional form. I mean, so here's the thing about being a transitional form, right? When you have groups with reasonably well-defined anatomical structures and morphology and whatnot, and you expect, based on evolution, there to be a common ancestor between those groups, then you can make predictions about what an intermediate morphology would look like. And if you find that morphology in a fossil or a living organism, that is a transitional form. Whether or not it's actually the literal ancestor of one group or the other doesn't matter. You predicted that Morphology X should exist if these two groups have common ancestry the way I think they do based on evolution. If you find morphology X, that is evidence that you were right. It's almost like one's a theory and one is just ad hoc like reasoning based on a preconceived conclusion. Yep. Because don't theories make predictions that end up being confirmed? Well, the good ones do. And the yeah. ones that don't tend not to be Bust as theories, like phlogiston theory. I'm struggling to think of something offhand that the quote creationist theory has predicted that has been discovered to be like coherent with reality. Um, if you ex if you're okay with old Earth creationism, then the universe having a start is the only thing I can think. Okay. Because that was expected by old Earth creationists, and not expected by most other people. Hmm. So. That's the only thing I can think of. I mean, there's a reason why uh, the Jesuit who first proposed the Big Bang was a big fan of it. He thought it was because he thought it was a confirmation of the idea that God created. Because otherwise, the universe didn't seem to have a beginning. But nope, turns out it did. So he was pretty happy <laughs> about that. Um, which is then odd that Answers in Genesis and all the young Earth creationists hate it so much. It's like, I mean, okay, if you want to throw away like the one prediction you guys got right, have fun. Yeah, but he was a Jesuit and conspiracy oh, Illuminati um, New World Order. Yeah. Something. As, as someone who's not really a fan of the Catholic Church, it's still weird to me the degree of like conspiracy nonsense about the Jesuits. It's like, guys, it's just a bunch of priests who answer directly to the Pope instead of the local uh, hierarchy. That's literally all it is. It's, you know, Illuminati New World Order conspiracy. <laughs> I guess. They must all triangle be Masons. Masons. Too. Yeah, Triangle Masons. <laughs> Um, in 1881, Othniel Charles Marsh did, uh, created Theropoda suborder, now clade, grouping all known dinosaurs from the tri uh, Triassic and the carnivorous dinosaurs from the Jurassic and Cretaceous. Um, it is no longer the case. Wild all Guts Triassic. at Gibbon appears. Hey, Guts at Gibbon, how's it Woo going? Um, it is no longer the case that all dinosaurs in the Triassic are theropods. We have uh, sauropodomorphs in the Triassic, like plateosaurs. Uh, the carnivorous dinosaurs from the Jurassic and Cretaceous, yeah, basically. Uh, Jack Gauthier described Theropods 1986 via cladistics, an evolutionary method that infers ancestry as a group of birds and all Sauriscians, dinosaurs. N no, no, because no. sauropods are Sauriscians, but they're definitely not theropods. They're the sister group to theropods. I, maybe, maybe it's Weiss Hampel that got it wrong in 2004, although I doubt it. Remember, this is a PhD paleontologist writing this paper. This is really bad. Uh, it is necessary to say that the traditional meaning uh, is intended when the word theropod, feather, bird, and aves are used in this paper, and not the modern meaning influenced by evolutionary ideas. Which, <laughs> reminder, again, the thing you're arguing is a bird doesn't meet the traditional classification of bird. Just, just I'm a just going to mention Linnaeus to sound smart and then completely ignore all of the things that he listed for defining a bird. Yeah, like, uh, look, 
it's the same thing as when someone's like, oh, I'm a traditionalist, and then they pick something that's like been the case for like 50 <laughs> years. It's like, you know, that's not really very traditional, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. I'm a traditionalist. I think there should definitely be empty cans on the back of your car after you get married. It's like, dude, that's been a tradition <laughs> for like 30 years max. <laughs> Um, Archaeopteryx, a dinosaur with feathers. The presence of feathers has been the key to classifying an animal as a bird based on the classical, conventional, and traditional taxonomy developed by Linnaeus in the 18th century. And notice, she doesn't cite Linnaeus. <laughs> she cites a different pay. You, you could have just cited Linnaeus. It's, it's right there on the internet. You yeah, can just find see, it. If you cited Linnaeus directly, you would have seen all the other stuff that he lists for a bird and realized, oops. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. However, various workers have changed and adapted the classification system before and after Darwin, including you, Dr. Haynes. Oh my goodness. You don't use the actual original definition of bird. The Linnaean classification was based on similarities in creatures. Well, and differences. Okay. But in contrast, Darwin's classification is based on their supposed ancestry, which is inferred from the similarities and differences and their patterns. Yes. When Again, it, it's just too bad that there have been no developments in science at all since not a one. Darwin. Not one. Uh, one can see the data never changed because the animals and their features have been the same. Instead, the lenses used to interpret them have changed. But that's not true. <laughs> we've we found new species, new specimens, new measurements, better measurements, better technology. The data has changed. Or have, to be fair, because it's a plural word. Whatever. Uh, like... <laughs> It's just a lie to, to say that there's no, been no change in the data. But there has. Some secular and creation scientists have considered Archaeopteryx a reptile or a theropod dinosaur, not a bird. Plain Patron, Spites, whatever. The later base, the oh, latter, probably. The latter bases classification on statistical baromenological analysis, which are based on cladistics. That's true. A baromenology is basically just using the techniques of evolution to try to prove that evolution isn't true. Except within certain groups where it is true. Because that's the thing that makes sense, apparently. Uh, in Cladistics, is a hypothesized that the ancestor of birds is in the same ancestral line to which dinosaurs belong. That's a weird way to say it, but okay. For that reason, it is acceptable to identify a bird as a reptile. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That is correct. Under this new definition, it became correct to state that birds are living dinosaurs. Yes. The word yes. bird again, and Again, it's just the Chad yes meme again. Like, yep. Yes. The words bird and reptile are not meaningful in this method. Look, they never were. They were always colloquial terms for taxonomic groups. And taxonomy is a science, and science updates when new data come in. So are you saying that when, you know, I, I call a manta ray a C flap flap, that's not meaningful in this method? Correct. Yeah, that would not pass muster in, like, a paper about the taxonomy of... Like, say, contra I'm going to go fish. write a paper for AIG on it. <laughs> the, but look, submit a paper is one of the buttons right here. Like, you can just go to Answers <laughs> Research Journal and submit a paper. Oh my goodness. What would you... Oh, my God. You guys in the side chat. How big of a dare would it have to, like... What would the parameters of that dare have to be for me to actually put C flap flap in a paper <laughs> and submit to AIG? That would be amazing. Please do it. It danger noodle. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do know some people who've uh, submitted things to the Answers Research Journal. I can't say who or what because that's technically not public. But yeah, I do know some people who submit. Okay. Um. Oh, Theros Rex for two dollars says, Dapper, what's your favorite descendant? Uh, Abelosaurid. So one thing I have to point out is that while Abelosaurids are in fact um, uh, ceratosauroids. It is not clear that Ceratosaurus, the genus, is directly ancestral to Abelosauridae. So, just, you know. Um, but yeah, um, what's my favorite Abelosaurid? I mean, the obvious answer is always going to be, um, you know, Carnotaurus, because it's the, the famous one, it's the best known, as far as I know. Um, but really, I think it's Majungasaurus. And the reason for that is because we have evidence of the air sac system that it used to breathe, and it had the exact same air sacs as a bird. Like, it had the, the abdominal air sacs, the, the cervical air sacs, the thoracic air sacs. And like, it was just a bird respiratory system in a Majungasaurus, which is not particularly close to birds. Which meant that this system of air sacs and a probably rigid lung goes way back in Dinosauria. Possibly oh, all man. the way back to Theropoda, but maybe even farther back, because we also know that... Um, 
pterosaurs had a similar respiratory system with air sacs. So it might just go all the way back to like Ornithodira, which would mean that basically all dinosaurs and pterosaurs and their relatives like Scleromachlis and Lagerpaton and uh, Lagosuchus and things like that might have all just had the, respir the respiratory system that's basically a bird's. So I think Majungasaurus is my answer for favorite Abelosaur. The <laughs> Steve Reno said, submit KJV get title. <laughs> if you submit something to the ARJ, it has to have that as a citation somewhere. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, however, there are many problems with bird and dinosaur relationship hypothesis. Two of them will be discussed briefly. Oh, good. Let's let's get into the problems here. Which, by the way, we still haven't had a definition for dinosaur. Yep. We're not going to get kind. one. Not uh, get or one kind, one. or bird, for that matter. Except, oh, I'm yeah. using the Linnaean definition. Except. No, you're not. Um, about 100 years after Darwin presented his theory of evolution, the theory of phylogenetic systematics, which is with its method that has been used in cladistics, was formalized by Billy Hennig. That's a great name. Anyway, a phylogenetic systematics is practiced in the light of evolution, aiming to demonstrate evolutionary history and relationships. And it has become the preferred method for phylogenetic analysis. Yeah, there's a reason for this, right? <clears throat> so in Linnaean taxonomy, we had these ranks. But none of them were really defined. Like, what is a class or an order or a family? So a family is a grouping of, or, or a genus, right? So a, a genus is a grouping of similar species. How similar? And similar. A family is a grouping of similar genera. How similar? Again, whatever. Um, a class is a group, or sorry, an order is a grouping of similar families. And so on, all the way up to kingdom, right? But one of the things you notice is that a group of similar X isn't a real definition. It doesn't mean anything, right? They're fundamentally arbitrary. And that's okay, because Linnaean classification was just a convenient way for humans to put organisms in boxes. They could talk about them more easily. That's fine, right? Having arbitrary distinctions like this is, is perfectly okay. It's like, which side of the road is the correct one to drive on? Well, a priori, there isn't one. But everyone needs to agree on what it's going to be in any given place, or you're going to have a problem. Like, do you drive on the left or the right? Both are fine, but you got to pick. Um, Cyborg, man, Cyborg, who's been a member for 21 months, my goodness, at the amniote level, thank you very much, sends a Godzilla emoji. AIG sunt saculum nequent movere, Google Translate. All hell the great void. Thank you. Unfortunately, this isn't one of the drinking streams, so I can't take a drink. For, well, I mean, I could take a drink, but my coffee is out. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, Nessie 20 says, they complain about cladistics. However, if creationism is true, cladistics would recover rampant polytomies regarding the interrelationship between the Behrmans. Yes, that's true. So a polytomy is basically where your, your cladistic analysis can't tell who branched first in a group. And so rather than having uh, a node with two branches, which is what you're, that's the ideal, right? Nodes should only have two branches, ideally. You have nodes that just have a bunch of branches, right? So no common ancestry should predict that there are unresolvable polytomies in most large-scale uh, phylogenetic analyses. But that isn't what happens. Like, we know what the prediction would be if common ancestry were not true. Now, you could say, oh, what about the design? Like, okay, well, we'll just restrict it to neutral variation in the DNA, right? We'll just do phylogenetics, neutral variation. This is things like um, different synonymous codons, uh, non-coding regions, things like that. You still get the same phylogenies. It doesn't help the creationism. Um, anyway, I, you could also, of course, argue, well, God just made it that way. Like, okay, well, God's lying to me then. That's great. I'm still going to go with the evidence, whether God's lying to me or not. Um, <clears throat> in the evolutionary worldview, the main characteristic used for classification are those that allow a path evolution of certain groups to be revealed. Therefore, the observed features that end up being used in a phylogenetic analysis are those that provide some adaptations to the creatures and changes due to new adversities. That's not always true. Neutral variation is, in fact, used to, to come up with these things. Uh, for taxonomy, this is an important point because it implies that a supposed adversity, in quotes from the original, can be understood as introducing new function and purpose. Basically, just Dr. Haynes complaining that scientists think natural selection is real. Which, yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. You probably do, too, because you work for AIG and not ICR. Um... <clears throat> Since evolution is the basis on which cladistics was built, a crucial issue must be highlighted. It is based on a sentence written by Ernst Meyer, one of the most influential biologists, oh, evolutionist biologists who devoted his studies to evolution and genetics. I know oh. this is nitpicky, but 
isn't it supposed to be evolutionary biologist? But well, then again, she was writing for AIG where they think evolutionist. So it's like some kind of like ew, evil dunk. In her writing, evolutionary biologist would mean that you're a biologist who specializes in evolutionary theory, whereas evolutionist biology biologist doesn't specify your specialty, but it specifies that you believe evolution as opposed to not believing. It's a weird thing to say for a biologist, but okay. Yes, it is. But I mean, to some extent, Dr. Haynes is kind of a biologist who doesn't believe in evolution. So. Uh, of course, she also produces this travesty, so I don't know. I think they can have her. Uh, evolution is a historical process that cannot be proven by the same arguments and methods which, by which purely physical or functional phenomena can be documented. Evolution as a whole and the explanation of a particular evolutionary events must be inferred from observations. Such inferences subsequently must be tested again and again. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's how science works. However, most inferences made by evolutionists have now been tested successfully so often they are accepted as certainties. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. basically what Meyer is saying is, look, we can't watch the literal descent of, say, the apes that would split to become chimpanzees and humans. Like, we can't time travel to watch all those apes have sex and give birth all through time to get there, right? What we have to do is we have to make predictions based on the idea that that's what happened and then test make of the organisms in question. And then if the, the, if the predictions are confirmed, then that is evidence that the idea was right in the first place. That is the correct ancestry. It's just so baffling. It's like you put that the inferences have been tested successfully. Successfully. So often they are accepted as certainties. Like, yes, that is exactly how science works. I don't know why you're quoting this as if it's some sort of dunk. Like, we made an inference, and then we tested it. Oh, hey, look! We were it right! Confirmed our, it confirmed our little prediction. Let's test it again, and again, and again, and again. Oh, wait! This has been confirmed over and over. Hmm. Must be a thing sure. that happened. Yeah. Note that he said evolution is a historical process. Yes, he did. That means it cannot be observed, tested, or repeated because it happened in the unobserved past. Okay, hold on. Oh my god, AIG, with this crap again, it's like, oh, you have to observe, test, and repeat it. It's like, what, guys. Wait. Read this sentence. What, what does it say? However, most inferences made by evolutionists have now been tested. Look, if you're gonna lie about what someone's saying, maybe don't debunk yourself. Like, you're just quote mining badly. You could just stop at the ellipsis, right? You don't have to include this last sentence that directly contradicts this part. Because apparently they can be tested. Oh, well, if we can't put evolution in a lab, it didn't happen, except that we do, and yeah. it does. And yeah. it did. Evolution definitely happens in labs. Um, because of that, he says those explanations must be inferred. Yep, that's how you do science. He was also right when he said that inferences must be tested. Yes, yep. and, and we did successfully. So often, they're accepted as certainty. Right, like, you quoted the bit that shows you why this is dumb. Oh, goodness. Uh, so what, you're just saying you got to make a prediction and test it? Yes. <laughs> oh, goodness. That quote also reveals that evolutionist scientists assume that everything came into existence through evolution. Uh, no, it, it shows no, that they that's... test that. Right. But the thing is, when you start off in science, right, you make an assumption. You think, okay, I'm going to assume that the X is the case. What do I expect to see if X is the case? Well, I expect to see, you know, X, Y, and Z. Okay, we test. Oh, look, we found that. Good. It's like, that was the case. There's no problem with assuming in science. It's just that you have to make assumptions that have testable predictions, and then you have to test them. And if you're shown to be wrong, you have to either change the assumption or get rid of it. Uh, so then they develop methods, in this case, cladistics, which is also based on evolution. I mean, kind of, to test how everything came into existence. The thing is, cladistics can, in fact reveal that there is not common ancestry if there isn't. Like Nestle 20 had pointed out earlier, if you got irresolvable, irresolvable frequent polytomies in your cladistic analysis, that would be direct refutation. Uh, or, well, it would be, it would make common ancestry significantly less likely, right? It would mean that it's essentially no more likely than just random chance. That would be what we would expect to see if common ancestry is false. I just, uh, I, yeah. I know that she's <laughs> not talking about, 
like DNA in classifying things based on, you know, genetic descent or whatever. But I it's just it's like the elephant in the room. It's like, oh, we looked at this stuff and it looks like it's related. So evolution definitely happened. Like, no, we yeah, have no. so many other ways to verify and confirm and classify, like also in the chat, uh, logistics and uh ugh. Afotep in the chat says, uh, okay, so we have to murder a few more people to solve murder cases. Yes, that's the I only was way. Say, we gotta go back and do another murder in the lab, you guys. We we can't test this theory without murdering someone. Yep, only option. Um, in a lot Ooh, of yeah, and they're talking about uh, Mini Minute Man's uh, recent videos on the lineage. Like they did, um, I can't remember the first word, Suda something Chidensis, and then the one that came out the yesterday was. Chidensis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then the one that came out yesterday was really good. Like so, yes, Guts of Giving, you should definitely watch them. They're very great. Yeah, they are really bones and stuff. Uh, that quote also reveals that evolution scientists assume that everything came into existence through evolution. So they then develop methods, in this case, cladistics, which is also based on evolution, to test how everything came into existence. In a logical analysis, the evolutionary inferences are tested by evolutionary methods, evolutionary based methods, and interpreted through an evolutionary worldview to make evolutionary conclusions accepted as certainties. That is circular reasoning. What? No. No, it's not. Did, did she not just quote the part where it said that they tested these things successfully? Yeah, but the tests are based on evolution themselves. Oh my god. Except the thing is, the tests are capable of resolving what non-common ancestry would look like. They just failed the thing to do is, so. You can't test for God. That is quite literally, by its definition, outside the realm of science. The only things that we can use science for are things in the natural world. So, what other worldview, quote unquote, are you supposed to be using? Because evolution's about the natural world. Look, scientists should be assuming that literally everything that happens in their lab is the direct will of God creating miracles. Just very consistent oh, ones. Goodness gracious. Um, therefore, this chain of reasoning is faulty and its conclusions are not logical. Uh, I mean, you didn't show that, but okay. Oh, and out of left field, we have a wild Otangelo coming in with the irreducible complexity oh. argument. I'm going to add that to my bingo um, card. Uh, beer, 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 beer. Which is also fun because it's actually irrelevant. Even if it's true that feathers couldn't evolve because they're irreducibly complex, it doesn't make Archaeopteryx not a dinosaur. It just means that yep. some dinosaurs were created with feathers. Okay. Wah, wah. Dr. Osiris, welcome to Tetrapod. Welcome back to Tetrapod. Rejoining. Thank you very much. Anyone who is a member, feel free to send some Tetrapod emojis to Dr. Osiris. Um, okay. In summary, they use evolutionary assumptions to make evolutionary observations tested by evolutionary methods to prove that evolution is true. I mean... Oh, Tangelo, you didn't have to say the words irreducibly complex in order to be making the irreducible complexity argument. It's literally your only thing that you ever talk about. I know, it's just like you said, oh, well, it's other, very complex. It requires th a lot of stuff, yeah. therefore it's designed. No, to be honey, fair, sometimes he, he talks Goodbye. about uh, the Shroud of Turin. Fake. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So the first problem with cladistics is that it, the method of reasoning used by evolutionary scientists is faulty. That is, the use of cladistics on Archaeopteryx, as well as on any other fossil set, has methodological problems because it has evolutionary assumptions and faulty <laughs> logic. Which is weird, because the same methods are frequently used by creationists to try to figure out what the kinds are. The thing is, like... Someone, please! It's like, you know the Simpsons where she goes, someone, please think of the children. This is me going, well, someone, please define what a kind is. No. Literally not possible. <laughs> I mean that. I, I mean that. It's literally not possible. No, Otangelo, the burden of proof is on people saying it's real. Again, goodbye. Yeah. You are the weakest link. Plus, it's a medieval piece of cloth. It's a medieval piece of cloth. It doesn't even mm. matter if you... It don't, you remember how when you get out of the shower and you press the towel to your face and it makes a, like a wackadoo impression of your face that doesn't look anything like the way your face looks because it's all warped because you're putting a 3D object on a flat surface? Weird how the shroud doesn't show any warping like that, but mm, yeah, it's probably just, you know, coincidence. Look, he, here's my thing. Even if I assume... The Shroud is a complete miracle. That, that image on there came about from the direct action of God. It's still not Jesus' burial shroud because it's from the 14th century or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And again, a tangible, you're made to claim it's fake. Okay, here's how I can tell you that it's fake. The cloth is from the, what would you say, the 13th century? I don't remember exactly. It's, it's medieval. It's medieval. The cloth 
is not even close to being old enough, so yeah. goodbye. We're, we're like a millennium out of, out of the range. Oh. Science doesn't care how the image was made because it's art. Look, like I said, even if it's a miracle. Still even not, so, it's not a burial shroud. Still not so. the burial shroud of Jesus. <laughs> anyway, weird tangent back to Archaeopteryx, which is definitely yep. dinosaur. It, it is. Uh, let's see. The assumptions for reasoning cannot be stripped out of the methods since those assumptions in faulty logic are often unrecognized and unknown by the evolutionists. So this whole thing is basically, we can't use cladistics to tell how things are related while also using cladistics to try to figure out how the kinds evolved from Noah's Ark. Because the Ark encounter, which is run by the same group here, answers, or, uh, answers in Genesis. It's chock full of little cladistic trees that show like, oh, here's the, the original cat it stepped off the ark and it evolved into the, they don't say evolved, but they say, you know, turn into the lion and the tiger and the jaguar and the house cat and the bobcat and the puma and the African wildcat or whatever. Actually, I guess African wildcat is just the ancestor. European wildcat. There we go. Um, yeah. yeah, like, or the South American fishing cat, which is adorable and tiny. Um, how did you figure that out? Was it cladistics? Oh, it was. Hmm. Yeah, weird. Weird hmm. how that works. From a creationist perspective, the premises of evolutionary approach are not biblical, except that you use them too. You accept them. That's one of the things that really bugs me, is creationists don't reject evolution. They accept evolution fully. They just don't fully accept universal common ancestry. They have a separate ancestry model, which, I mean, we've tested and already falsified, like, you know, a century ago, but whatever. But everything else, all of that stuff from the arc evolving... That's all evolution. It's all using evolutionary processes. And then you get ICR who tries to say, oh, well, we're going to get rid of um, natural selection. And then like literally every other creationist organization out there is like, no, that's dumb. <laughs> that's, that's the closest I've seen to any young earth creationist who doesn't I, actually accept evolution because they all do. I just look, I, I cannot get past this sentence where she says that an authority's assessment try to prove point is also false reasoning and formal logical fallacy called appeal to authority. I'm like, literally all of young earth creation is appeal to authority. All of it. All of it. The Bible says this, therefore this. And then they go backtracking, trying to justify it with science. But it's appeal to authority every single time. Well, we don't understand it because God. But we do understand this thing because God. But the Bible said this, it's appeal to authority. That's all you have. Wait a minute, isn't, isn't a tangible ban evading right now? Mm. I don't know. Let's find out. Because he's still going on about the shroud, which is weird because it's off topic. Although, to be fair, I did bring it up. So, you know, I can't complain okay. too much. Yeah, that is fair. But, um, I wonder, is, is he banavating right now? Um, yeah, anyway. So, uh, from a creationist perspective, these premises of uh, evolutionary approach are not biblical. Well, that's great. I mean, the Bible is the book that says that if your cattle mate in front of stripy sticks, they'll have stripy babies. Also, <laughs> Shroud illustrated in manuscript from 1192, honey, that's that's like a thousand plus years too old to be a shroud from someone that allegedly died in the first century. Plus, um, that, that's way too old, my friend. People knew that burial shrouds were a thing, and so someone drawing a burial shroud is not exactly. Also, <laughs> he says... I don't need authority or the Bible to understand the soft tissue can't be millions of years old. Well, it's because they didn't find actual soft tissue. They found cells yeah. that were activated in a lab by accident that turn out to be. You know, come on. Goodness gracious. Can't even get your own arguments right. But he oh. is ban evading. Look at that. He's the hmm. fourth person on my list of hidden users. What do you know? A tangelo man can't do that. That's not fair. Oh, well. Oh, wah, wah. Otangelo is the only person to go from a moderator to band in one day on this channel. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Otangelo. Um, maybe, maybe contact me privately and you can, you can plead your case as to why I should uh, lift the ban that was basically for you trying to spam links to your blog that's just list of sources <laughs> that you haven't read. I'm not going to say that they're right, but there's people pointing out that the grammar's too good and that might be unfair to laugh at, but... You think it might be one of the fake Otangelos? Because yeah. there are a couple fake Otangelos out there. Mm -hmm. 
And I was going to say, it did seem a bit too coherent, but mm. what do I know? Faux Tangelo, as Tapio Gilrizo puts it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good. Um, <laughs> Angelo, contact me. We'll talk. <laughs> Faux Tangelo, I'm dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Even if claimed by Christians, creationists, or anti-evolutionists believe otherwise, mere belief does not make it right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> Once again, submit to r slash self-awerewolves. Yep. I was Use... about to type that in chat. Using an... We should just put this whole paper on there. It really, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Using an authority assessment to try to prove a point is also faulty reasoning. This is literally a just... literature survey. That's the whole point of your paper, Dr. Haynes is to use oh. the authority of other papers to draw your conclusions as a result of you trying to establish what the state of the field is. Ugh. My goodness. This, okay. this leads to the second problem with cladistics. Subjectiveness and arbitrariness. Oh. <laughs> okay. Goodness. This, this Again, is from the group that... Again, define a kind yeah. and don't be arbitrary about it. This, this is Challenge from the group impossible. who says that Goats and sheep are in one kind, and cattle are in another kind, but also every songbird in the entire world is all in one kind. <laughs> okay, sure. Right. This leads to the second problem with cladistics. Yeah, okay, we read that. Which, which the history of Archaeopteryx show, also showcases. Oh, does it? So basically, that there have been open questions about Archaeopteryx showcases how subjective and arbitrary science is. Hmm. The same methods have led various groups to make opposite conclusions. Gee, almost like it's a transitional form that's hard to classify because it's so neatly huh. between two groups. It's so transitional, it can't be transitional. Hmm. Weird. Ooh. Some conclude that Archaeopteryx was a dinosaur. Yeah, basically everyone. Theropod yeah. sensu stricto. Okay, look. What's the what's the wide version of theropod? Because sensu stricto means in the strict sense. Theropod in the strict sense. Which is uh oh what's the what's the counterpoint? Senso Sensu uh, I don't remember. That's a given. If you're here, let me know, because I know you know it. Um, <clears throat> but basically, the opposite is like, oh, in a wide sense, theropod. What's, what are the two different senses of theropod? Like, birds are theropods, sensu stricto. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, it was a dinosaur with feathers. Yeah. All of the groups conclude that it was a dinosaur with feathers, whether or not they concluded it was a bird. Archaeopteryx placement is still in dispute in the secular camp. I mean, to some extent. The discovery of Xiaotingya Zhang in 2011 helped to shift Archaeopteryx from Aviale to Deinonychosauria, according to some workers. The result challenged the meaning of Archaeopteryx in light of supposed transition of birds. Not really. And if confirmed, its avial and ancestral condition would have, have to be uh, re-evaluated. I mean, yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> Katsu Gidman and Dr. Joel Duff both said... Uh, Leto. Sensu... Yeah, Sensu Leto. There we go. Okay, yeah, that is right. Sensu Leto. Yeah, what's the Sensu Leto for theropod? I don't know. That's never been bothered to, die, to be identified. You're just like, theropod, Sensu Stricto. Dude, you can't just say that. <laughs> you gotta tell me what the strict sense is. But but it sounds important and smart. It's true, although it also should be italicized, was it? No. Yes, it should. <laughs> fun, fun thing here, guys, if you're writing a, a paper in English and a phrase is in another language, you need to italicize that phrase. Just a formatting thing. But um, this journal does have editors. They should have caught that. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> maybe this is the journal that Rawmat can finally get published in. God. Because apparently they don't care too much about formatting. Another um, faux tangelo. Wah, wah. Wah. Look, a, a tangelo. You Fotangela. can contact, well, Fotangela, either one of you, contact me privately, and we can have a chat about why you're currently hidden, whether or not you should be unhidden, whether or not your a ban evasion is actually more reason to ban all your alts, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Theros Rex says, Sinosauropteryx is an awesome feathered dinosaur. I love Sinosauropteryx. Um, Sinosauropteryx is one of the first dinosaurs that we ever found out what color they were. Yeah! Which is so freaking cool, because I remember growing up, and like being kind of sad that like every dinosaur book I had said, oh, we'll never know what color dinosaurs are. I was like, oh, that sucks. But then, nope. <laughs> Scanning electron <laughs> microscopes, finding melanosomes, and being able to tell what color mel melanin it is. It's like, yes, please, more of this. And then since then, we've also done things like, uh, we know Microraptor had iridescent feathers that were black feathers, yes. so it looked like a crow. Yes. Which is just awesome. <laughs> anyway, um, the result, challenge meaning, yeah, whatever. Um, 
reclassified Archaeopteryx back into Aviale. However, in uh, July 2019, Hartman et al. placed Archaeopteryx in Dinonicosauria, whereas in February 2020, Cow shifted it back again to Aviale. So, phylogenetic analysis diagram by Hartman et al. placed Archaeopteryx outside the bird group, which indicates, uh, arrow indicates the position of Archaeopteryx. So, we're going to zoom in a little bit here. Oh. Woo! Where'd it go? Oh, can we not? Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so, here we have Archaeopterygidae, and it comes out, and then let's see, we have Dromaeosauridae as one of the branches here. We have, yeah, so Archaeopterygidae is in Deinonychosauria in this group, although a little odd that Halscoraptorinae is actually outside of Dromaeosauridae, according to this, which is odd to me because I was under the impression it was pretty well established that Halscoraptor was in fact a Dromaeosaur, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh, um, uh, Paleologo says creationists hmm. have to find a kind. A kind is a group of organisms that share a common ancestral population, are reproducibly, re sorry, reproductively incompatible, and morphologically distinct from other organisms. Yes. To which sorry. Nico kind of responds, but all dogs are a kind. Domestic dogs aren't reproductively compatible with African wild dogs. Yeah, see, the problem is that, that that's a definition that can't be tested. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. Because... By that definition, because kinds include organisms, so there's there's two options, right? We know that organisms have common ancestry now, even according to creationists that are reproductively isolated, which means either kinds don't exist because apparently they require some kind of reproductive capability, but we know that can be violated, or it means that that's not actually a requirement. You can actually have reproductively incompatible organisms in the same kind, in which case there's no way to tell for sure whether or not organisms aren't in the same kind, which means that humans could be in the same kind with E. coli. Mm. So I know that there is a definition. It's just that when I say we need a definition, it's shorthand for we need a definition that's actually testable and that we can actually use to determine which things are and aren't in different kinds objectively, oh, such that see. independent observers can come to the same conclusion, even if they use wider data sets. Um, so anyway, yeah, we'll we'll close this. The follow-up is reproductive barriers can arise within a kind. Therefore, hybridization is solely an addi additive criterion, not an exclusionary one. But that's a little ad hoc-ish. So basically, that's just saying that if it can uh, reproduce, then it is in the same kind as the thing it reproduces with. Which okay, but we need a disconfirmation option. Confirmation is nice yeah. and all, but disconfirmation is the real key, right? We need yeah. Falsification is basically one of the like foundations of the scientific method, so. Okay, here's a phylogeny of Manoraptors from Cow 2020 with places Archaeopteryx within the bird group. So uh, there's supposed to be an arrow. Where the heck is it? Tiniest little, I, I can't even read this. It's this ridiculous. I think that's not very good formatting to have in a paper, but I mean, like, I, you have at least zoomed it into the relevant part or at least showed an inset. Does it have an inset? I know, sort of. Um, no, it just has a confidence. That is whisker. really not good. I'm going to open this another window and see if I can get it. This is, so this is a lot. <laughs> there's a lot happening here. If uh, so it, there's supposed to be an arrow. I don't see an arrow. But, oh, there it, it is. Like Archaeopteryx the lithographic. There it is. Where, what's it under? Um, so it's near Aviale. If you go up from the first Aviale branch and then up again from the second one, we get Archaeopteryx lithographica. Then the next one down is Archaeopteryx Albert Fordensis. And then we have oh, Tingia, Yishianosaurus, uh, Saracornus, Theosinopteryx. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yep, yeah, there we go. Archaeopteryx in there. Uh, discontinuity is a testable prediction, says Paleologus. We can find groups. Yes, but addressed check out what's later on. see the problem with discontinuity is that we would expect discontinuity of a certain amount and also um when wider uh, groups are tested for even using barominology generally speaking you can still find good reason to support common ancestry between groups in order to say that discontinuity isn't going to be an option you have to be able to say that you definitely have covered all of the organisms in the group that have existed which you can't really say with much confidence. So I am very skeptical of the usefulness of discontinuity on its own to identify kinds. Um, okay. Let me zoom on a little bit. That's a little... There we go. Okay, here we are, back to where we were. 
Uh, but then again, this is not supposed to be the kinds fight, really. Uh, that is one example of how subjectively and arbitrarily these those hypotheses of evolutionary relationship can be applied. How is any of that subjective? Or so the thing is, if you want to say this is subjective, right? These two things which do come to different conclusions, right? Although both of them come to the conclusion that Archaeopteryx is a dinosaur. Because <laughs> look, we go back here, and this one where it's a bird in Aviale, if we we're defining bird as you know, synonymous with Aviale. Starts with Tetanure. That's a group of theropods. That's so both of these have it as a oh come on. Let me get out of here. You may want to open that in a different tab. Uh, I did the first time. Mess up your formatting, but Yeah. I holy moly. I did the stupid thing. It's my fault. Not Dr. Haynes' fault. Although it's a little bit the answers researcher on a website fault. A little bit their fault. Okay. Anyway. The same data have been interpreted by different groups of scientists with different assumptions. <laughs> have you seen Zoolander? <laughs> Yes. What is this, a diagram for ants? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the thing is, I actually don't think those use the same data. My guess is they actually use different character suites and made justifications as to why those character suites were the ones that they should be using. Um, but also they may have used uh, different uh, analysis methods. Like one of them may, might have been using like um, uh, parsimony. The other one might have been using like Bayesian inference. There's more than one way to, to run your analysis, and different analyses with the same data are going to give you different results. But none of them gave a result of Archaeopteridae outside of Dinosauria, so yeah. And the same data have been interpreted by different groups of scientists with different assumptions, leading not only to distinct conclusions, but to opposite conclusions. I don't know how ABL, Archaeopteryx being in or out of Aviale versus Dinonicosauria are opposite conclusions. I don't know what that would mean. What's the opposite of a dinosaur? Mm. If anyone knows what the opposite of a dinosaur is, please let me know in the chat. Do you <laughs> think we could put that in the coffee machine like we did with anti-water? Anti-dinosaur? You know, you're, you're always doing the deep cuts for the SCP lore. <laughs> is that a deep cut, though? Uh, that I hear people talk about when they're just casually discussing SCP. Oh, huh. okay. Like, I, I hear people talking about, like, the hard-to-kill reptile... Or like uh, SCP-1000, uh, the, the, the statue, yeah. yeah. But the, the coffee maker, not so much. That one's oh, stupid. the a no, trolley. Tapioca no. Weasel says a trolley a is trolley. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a T-Rex uh, racing down the, the, the rails. On one side, there's five people tied up. On the other, there's only one. <laughs> you can switch the gate, so the T-Rex only eats one guy. No, man, it's... On one side are five different nested hierarchies, and on the other side, there's one kind. You could pull the lever and destroy Ooh. one. Which do you pick? Okay, so here, here's the great thing. Cladistics can place Archaeopteryx in either category, bird or dinosaur, except... Dinosaurs. <laughs> Birds are dinosaurs. It's always placing them in dinosaurs, man. Like, oh my God. look at the root of your tree. It's tetanure. Dr. Haynes, did you look that word up? Did you find out what tetanure is? Because it's a group of theropods, it's basically the group of theropods to which Ceratosaurus doesn't belong. It's on the Allosaurus side. D did you check? D did you? Because I feel like you didn't even look up the word. I, I mean, <sighs> she did say something about like, oh, I'm going to use the Linnaean definition and then totally ignored Linnaeus. So True. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she didn't look it up. Yeah. Some scientists blame evolution. <laughs> Okay, and conclude this confusion and lack... Oh, I see what she means. Uh, lack of resolution are related to rapid rates of evolution in some groups. Yeah, to some extent, right? So one of the things that you predict from evolution is that as you get closer to the common ancestors of what are currently distinct groups, they look more similar. Uh, that's why the ancestors of proboscideans, like elephants, and the ancestors of Serenians, like the dugong, look almost identical. Like the first proboscidean in the fossil record looks almost exactly like the first Serenian in the fossil record. Why? Well, because they're closely related groups in Afrotheria. So we would expect their first representatives to look very similar to each other. Um, and basically the only difference between them was one was ever so slightly more adapted for living in like swamps and like wetlands. The other one was more adapted for living in places like, you know, upland forests. There you go. Millions of years later, now we have dugongs and elephants. Hmm. Um, or like horses and rhinos. Horses, have, the earliest horses and the earliest rhinos are almost completely identical. The only difference is that 
The shape of the teeth is, teeth is a little bit different because at first, the only real difference between horses and rhinos, horses were uh, grazers and rhinos were browsers, which is still the case. But now again, millions of years later, no one's going to mistake, you know, a, a big rhinoceros for a zebra. This is, this is what we expect. We expect it to be hard to resolve relationships at the base of these trees. Which is, again, more evidence of the transitional nature of Archaeopteryx. Which is just, again, Dr. Haynes complaining that because Archaeopteryx is so transitional, it can't be transitional. Not a good argument. Uh, mm. Some creation scientists have also used the assumption of cladistics and its results to run baromenological analysis. Analyses, sorry. Yes, they have. After analysis is done by creation science uh, opponent, Center 2010, to prove evolutionary principles through baromenology, some creation scientists reanalyzed the data and came up with different results from one another's. Kavanaugh, Garner, Wood, Ross, 2013. Yeah, so this is actually one of the things about baromenology, is that it's fairly easy to, if you want to, prove more than what most baromenologists would be comfortable with. Um, in fact, I believe the cent Center 2010 was... Um, I don't remember if that was the apes and human thing or if that was the birds being dinosaurs. Thing. Those are both things that have been done, is using baromenological methods to say, say, hey, all of dinosauria, including birds, is just a kind. And also to go with, uh, hey, all of hominoid or hominididae, including humans, that's a kind too. Uh, Kavanaugh 2011 concluded that Archaeopteryx and all theropods, he interpreted Archaeopteryx as a theropod dinosaur, which both of the, the only two cladograms we've received both do that. Uh, might be part of the same created kind. Um, in that case, he understood Archaeopteryx as the ancestor of other theropods, not their descendant. Oh. What? What? It's, it's going to be both, most likely, right? Like. So are you telling <sighs> me that the sky, is it blue or is it a color? Yeah. Because that's the way this paper is written. Now, we don't know that Archaeopteryx had descendants. It might not have. Right? But if an organism has descendants, then its ancestors are in a group that it's in, and its descendants will be in that group, and it that's will be the like... ancestor and the descendants of members of the group. That sounds like clades. Yeah, a little bit. It's sort of like, let's say that you're, I don't know, you're Zambian. You're from Zambia. Sweet. Your grandparents are from Zambia and your grandchildren are from Zambia. You are both the ancestor and the descendant of Zambians. Because that's just how it works. This is like, this is like first grade level how ancestor descendant things worked. Like, your mommy and daddy have mommies and daddies, and if you become a mommy and daddy, then you'll have children who have a mommy and daddy. And <laughs> they, your mommy and daddy will be their grandmommy and daddy. Okay, Timmy? <laughs> Like, that's, that's the level we're talking at right here. The thing of Gray for $5 says, I entered my will to live into the coffee machine. It hummed for two minutes and returned out of range. Ooh. So good. My goodness. <laughs> Nathaniel Gray gets all the SCP references. I love it. I feel so validated. I feel so seen. That was really good. Uh, Dr. Osiris, who's been a member for 13 months. The yeah. 13 months, I literally just looked at it and said one year. Well, uh, maybe the an like the, the one year anniversary or the I guess one month repetition, whatever you know, is like clicked over. Also, yeah, Jacob. Some humans says some humans are terrible. Grandmas are decent people. My my grandmother is not a decent person <laughs> in many senses of the word. So yeah, just because you get old doesn't make you a good person. I've known a lot of great grandmas. I've also known some not so great grandmas. So yeah. I got, I've had both, so. Um, Garner Wood Ross analyzed some data sets and many of their analysis, Archaeopteryx was more correlated with Dromaeosauridae, a family of dinosaurs in some scientists' view. Like, literally every scientist's view, except like, uh, what's his name? Um, the birds are not dinosaurs guy. Uh, every creationist's favorite paleoornithologist who doesn't agree with them about anything, except that birds aren't dinosaurs. Uh, oh God. Eh, we'll probably get his name in here. Yeah, anyway. I'll come to me later. Um, he's... He hangs out with uh, like Lingam Soliar, who's another guy who's the, the birds are not dinosaurs group. They have really bad arguments. Um, Ta Tapioca Weasel says, I have a question. Uh, the phylum chordata is defined according to the by the presence of five distinct animals uh, at some point during its development. And it's one out of how many, so wait for the next fit. Um, oh, Alan, Alan Fiducia? 
Yes, Alan Fiducia. Whatever. Yep, Alan Fiducia. That's the name. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Alan Fiducia is basically the only guy who thinks that Dromaeosauridae is in the dinosaur group, and it's because he thinks that they're birds that convergently evolved to look exactly like dinosaurs. Oh my goodness. Because he's done the same thing as creationists, which is he's come up with a conclusion, and it doesn't matter what the evidence is. He's going to stick with it. And one of his conclusions is that birds aren't dinosaurs. They are still archosaurs. They evolved from a he, they evolved from a separate, apparently ghost lineage that survived all through the Triassic and into the Jurassic, only to emerge as birds. And then some of them then became flightless birds who just happened to convergently evolve to look exactly like theropods. Somehow. Yeah, that checks out. Uh, let's see. In one study, it appeared to be grouped with Avialon's bird group. They consider that Archaeopteryx might have been a dromaeosaurid. Yeah, maybe. I don't think so, but maybe. McLean Patron in Spites 2018 understood that Archaeopteryx has a high probability of being part of Dinosauria Holobarum. Okay. Holobarum, that's... Holobarum is uh, creationism for the entirety of a created kind. Uh, mm. Yeah. Which, by the way, can, can we just mention that the word Barriman has the worst etymology possible? So, it, oh, uh, Theos Rex for $2 says, obviously, a Utahraptor is a pigeon. Ugh. Basically. <laughs> um, so, Barriman is from two Hebrew words, bara and mean. But um, bara doesn't mean created like a passive participle. It means he created, third-person singular subject, non-future. I was going to say past, but that's not accurate. It's non-future. Um, and mean means like kind or type. You know, it's a group of things that are similar to each other. But the thing is, now, Fishanti, call me out if I get this wrong. Standard Hebrew word order is a verb, subject, object. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you're not an explicit word for the subject of the sentence there's a direct object marker that you can put after the word or is it before I don't uh-huh remember. now it's the it. it right now in the phrase but mean there's no direct object marker right correct and it is the first noun directly after the verb right uh-huh. and it agrees in number and person with the verb form right third person singular hmm. okay so the phrase bara mean doesn't mean a created kind. It means a kind created. That's exactly, that, that is a legitimate way to read that, yes. Okay. So, because um, without the, like, for the, for instance, if you didn't have the direct object marker in Genesis 1, it would read that the heavens and the earth created God. Yeah. So you need the direct object marker to tell you what is doing the bara. It... <laughs> It's almost like, like first year Hebrew students could figure out this is a bad etymology. It's just a word that they mash together because they're English speakers who don't know jack about Hebrew. Mm -hmm. I don't know so... jack about Hebrew. I know very little about Hebrew. And even I'm like, nope, my, my extremely basic knowledge of Hebrew says this is not how you do this. I, I can't even, I can't even dismantle the, the dumb of that word. Because it breaks my mind. Yeah. It's... <sighs> Look, that's just not how you do Hebrew. Creationists, I know that you have access to Hebrew speakers because I've seen you put people who've demonstrated proficiency with Hebrew in your videos. Ask them next time you want to do something with Hebrew. Just talk to them. And honestly, you gonna, you're gonna need biblical Hebrew because sometimes modern Hebrew does weird things. However, well, yeah. this is a, a biblical Hebrew type of word, and I just, I'm sorry, I can't. It's just breaking my brain. It's too dumb. Yeah, it's, it's all, every time I see Baramin, it makes my brain, like, break a little bit. Also, they always mispronounce mean. They always say min, oh, yeah. which means min, from. Yeah. yeah, that's the preposition it's from. It's the same thing they do with the word for day. They always say yom, and I'm like, no. Yom. Long yom. vowels. Learn them. That Vav isn't there for fun. <gasps> yo! Uh, just, like, well, at least, it's uh, like the, the Meryl Streep, yo! At least they're Do not doing the, um, the Hebrew-Israelite thing, where they're like, oh, Matras Lexiones is not part of, of Hebrew. It's, there, it's there's one vowel, and it's ah uh, uh, every time. Except when it's E. Except oh, so, when it's U. 
No, sometimes I say I, like Yahawashi instead of for uh, Jesus. Yahawashi. Oh, Yahawashi. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, Just... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Enough talking about bad Hebrew. <laughs> We're going to move on with the creationism, which is technically not the same <laughs> there thing. Was, there was Rex says, Dapper, a fucking dinosaur. I don't know much about Hebrew. Also, Dapper knows more about Hebrew than 99.9% of the human race. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, from these barometrological analyses, these creationists use statistical methods such as BDC, BDIST. Flurgle burgle. That's, I'm just going to start using flurgle burgle. Yeah, this is another For stylistic. These flurgle burgle analyses. <laughs> this is another um, stylistic thing. You can't put in uh, an initialism like this unless you previously spell it out. And then yeah. afterwards, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to put in parentheses the initialism. So you're supposed to, like, whatever BDC is, parentheses bdc and whatever bdist is parentheses bdist and the thing is like these aren't technical problems with the paper in terms of like does it make the paper right or wrong it's just like it's lazy there and are, unprofessional yeah there are standards of professional science right and if you want to be taken seriously you need to follow them it doesn't make you wrong but it does mean that it's hard to take this as a serious attempt at science. And you can't even get the basic things. Like, like you didn't italicize um, Latin. You didn't tell us what these, act, what these initialisms stand for, or things like that. Like, you got to do these things. Uh, didn't they, define bird. Didn't nope. define dinosaur. Nope, did not. Just, come on, man. They have devised methods. That, okay, look, we're, we're getting to the point where it's probably time to start calling up. So I'm going to skip down. If there's more, um, Clearistics uses different ambiguous terms and definitions. This is the next uh, Oh, are they actually going to try to a quick search of the definition of bird? Dude, <laughs> bird's a colloquial term. Yeah, looking up bird in a dictionary is not going to help. Bird, it's, it, dictionaries just tell you how a word is used. It doesn't tell you what words mean because they're prescript. They're not prescriptive. They're descriptive. And it usually tells you how it's used by the majority of the population, not specialists Currently. in a particular field. Yeah. So, um, like... See, also the word theory. <laughs> right. So um, lots of words have particular jargon uses. Like for instance, when the word spam first started being used for unwanted like emails and whatnot, and it wasn't a common word in you know everyday use. Looking at a dictionary would just tell you that spam is a processed pork product that was like mm -hmm. invented for World War II or something. Yeah. Guess what? If I say, oh, I got a ton of spam today, I probably don't mean that I picked up like 900 kilograms of processed pork meat. <laughs> just saying. Maybe I did, that's possible. But chances I mean, you are, do, you probably do have one heck of an appetite. I mean, yeah, that's true. I'm a very large dinosaur, although that's a lot of salt for me. Like a whole okay. ton of spam, because spam is very high in sodium. Yeah. Not everyone knows this, but uh, you, you give your spam a quick wash if you're going to cook spam. Ugh. Rinse it Ugh. off. It'll get rid of some of the salt. Not all of it, some of it. Woo! Anyway, um... A quick search of the definition of bird will lead you to find that birds are feather theropod dinosaurs and thus living dinosaurs. Birds are reptiles in... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Although it's kind of weird that you'd just be like, search for the definition of bird, but like, whatever. Um, as one can see, the word bird today does not mean what we used to know and understand about birds. Oh, you mean... You mean this thing that you Wait, are violating? You, the whole thing that's section two obvies. Mm-hmm. The, the, you know, the whole, like, <laughs> edentali. The yeah, the, the one that, that says the thing about no teeth and the bit about beaks too. Don't forget the beaks and the beaks. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the thing that says that you know Archaeopteryx isn't a bird. Weird. Mm -hmm. Weird. Okay. Another example is the term aviale, which was first, which was defined and named by Gauthier in 1986, who redefined Gautier. it into. Oh, Gautier. Gautier. Oh yeah, that's probably French, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Uh, Godier and De Caros in 2001. Aviale, yes. uh, depending on the definition you for it. I'm just being pedantic. Whether based on characters or based on ancestry, can split or lump, moving apart groups and creatures or gathering them together respectively. Dude, it's time to quote the definition, man. What are you doing? The, like, no definitions will be will be quoted. Just just look up Godier 1986. No, just it's no. put just it in put a it quote. in the paper. Put it right there. You're talking about how we're. Using bad definitions, give them. I mean, no. <laughs> <sighs> they attempted to solve the problem by using uh, more different definitions. In their view, only four of those groups should. And be I will used. list none of them. 
in their view, only four of those groups should be named Aves or Aves or whatever you want to say. Um, but to not bring in any resolution, they then decided on what the definition of those groups would be based. Uh, that is how they should be different and named. Okay. A bunch of stuff that's not the definition, a yeah. bunch more stuff that's not the definition. Goodness. Based on clinics, this question cannot be easily answered regarding the issue of what a bird is. It will depend on if the definition emphasizes composition over character, if the definition is based on composition, whether it is stem-based or node-based, if the definition is based on character, then which character or characters are more or the most important. If the most important characters can be derived, shared, if not, uh, which one should be, and five, which author's own research conclusion or which author's or research group's conclusion will be followed as convention. So basically, what this paper from Gautier and uh, what was it? Kiros. Kiros. Um, what their paper is about, at least according to Dr. Haynes, is hey, even in cladistics, right? What names we use and where we put those names on the chart is fundamentally still arbitrary, right? Yeah. We can define a clade using just about whatever we want as long as we stick to it. So, how do we define the clade? This isn't a question as to where, what the shape of the tree should be, who should be where in the tree. It's just what labels do we stick on it? So, like, if we just scroll up to look at one of the, um, the, the other, yeah. this, this cladogram here, right? And while you're so, looking at that, I, I do want to mention Apotep in the chat says, if we want fish to be a valid term in taxonomy, we're all fish. Mm -hmm. Well, in California, bees are fish. Which are not fish. <laughs> so, um, so, basically, yeah. the, the question here is, let's just take the shape of this, this tree, right? We'll just accept it for now. I want to put labels on the little nodes here to call these groups things. Where should I put aviale? Now this thing actually has aviale listed, and it's this um, it's this node here is where aviale should be. Even though the you know the labels are on this side, that's fine. Because like this whole thing, Manoraptora, which means that the Manoraptora node is here, the Deinonychosauria node is here, and the aviale node is here, right? But Gautier et al. are saying, like, well, what if Aviale should go here? Or maybe it should go here. Okay. Yeah. Those are all fine. You just need to have an answer. Right? It's the same thing as, like, the, which side of the road to drive on. There's not a wrong answer. But for the sake of everyone, we should come up with an answer. Uh, let's see. Okay. That is, on, uh, that is, depending on any one of the options listed above, Cladistics can produce different classifications. Yes, it can label different groups with uh, different labels. It doesn't change the shape of the tree. Cladistics has subjective applications because it is a hypothesized model. That is not what's going on here. The shape of the tree isn't subjective. Where you put the labels is. That's a judgment call. It doesn't affect the actual organisms, right? Uh, which means that different research groups have, have different hypotheses of this topic and different models of explanations of the supposed evolutionary relationships between organisms through inferences that lead to different, in many cases, opposite conclusions. I still don't know what an opposite conclusion is. <laughs> Anti-water. What's, what's the opposite of a dinosaur, Dr. Haynes? Tell me, please. Is bird the opposite of dinosaur? What, what does it mean to be the opposite of a clade? Because I don't know. So there was a question in the chat about how bees can be fish in California, and the very long story short is endangered species laws and ways to preserve things um the the justice in the court was saying like okay we know the the laws previously didn't use the word insects but invertebrates can be classified under fish long story short it's just a very arbitrary and silly way to preserve the bee population so whatever personally i think it's time to write a new law but eh. I, I mean why write new stuff when you can just, you know, uh, amend a bunch of other stuff and make it needlessly complicated? Maybe because that sort of like violates the very reason that you write laws down, just so that everyone knows what they say. Yeah, it was just, it was a quick way to loop them in to get them a protected status. Oh, so okay. The tapioca they're, weasel. They're, they're not saying that it's a scientific thing or that they're going, oh yeah, bees are absolutely fish or descended from fish. Like, no, they're just trying to loop them into a protected status. So. Okay, so Tapioca Weasel put his multi-part question in my Discord. By the way, guys, oh. fuck a month gets you into that Discord. So consider it. Uh, I have a question. The final chordata is defined uh, by the presence of five distinct anatomical features at some point during its development. One of these features is a post-tail, or presumably evolution could eventually eliminate the appearance of 
any point as in uh, as an embryo some future descendant of humans so my question is is my understanding of reasonably accurate if so how would the field of phylogenetics handle it okay so uh, that is the cladistic definition character based for chordata now no chordates currently violate that rule of having a postanal tail at some point in development um now cladistics recognizes that in some cases ancestral traits can be entirely lost right so um i think i think it's snakes don't even develop like four limb buds i believe um so does that mean they're not tetrapods no not really um Basically, the answer is that phylogenetics is the more accurate way to classify organisms, and cladistics is what we use when we don't have the option of using the actual genomes. Um, so cladistic definitions with character-based traits do have some exceptions there. Um, so it's sort of like chordata is defined with these things as the ancestral trait. That's the more nuanced way to say it. And yeah, sometimes that creates problems. Uh, there, are, there are organisms that are radically reduced and don't fit the character-based definition of their, their clade. Uh, like just recently I posted on twi Twitter uh, the crustacean uh, Dendrogaster. This is a crustacean that doesn't have any obvious segmentation. It doesn't have the thing that arthropods are named for, the jointed legs. It doesn't have legs at all. Um, it doesn't have antennae. It doesn't have mouth parts. It basically doesn't have any of the things that crustaceans have. It's still a crustacean. So. It, however, does have ancestors that had these things, and we can tell because its larvae are basically identical to like crab or copepod larvae. So, um, and of course, genetic testing reveals it a crustacean. Um, so yeah, uh, using the character-based uh, cladistic definitions can be a little tricky when you get to organisms that have significant reductions in their anatomy. I, I hope that clears it up. And uh, spiders are not crustaceans. That is. Spiders are not crustaceans. Yet. Mm, well, I mean, eventually they'll be crabs, <laughs> but that's just a Maybe morpho. Crabs. <laughs> Everything will evolve into a crab, a snake, or it will go extinct. Those are the only options. Yep. Um, only as a sequence of groups for didactic purposes, yet not represent. Great. Uh, so theropods, Lurosauria, Manoraptora, Peneraptora, Paravis, Humanoraptora, sometimes is also used sometimes. Despite being considered synonymous with paravies, some phylogenetic analysis demonstrate that they might group differently. Aviale avies. Yeah. Okay. This is just the standard classification of birds, right? So avies is like the crown birds. Birds that are alive today and things that are closer to living birds than they are to any other non-living bird, right? Um, aviale is the wider group of bird-like things, right? So it includes things like probably Archaeopteryx, definitely in Antiornis, and like things like that, like uh, Confucius Ornus. Um, Paravis is also, like Dr. Haynes says correctly, Humanoraptor is also sometimes used. Um, this is the group that is, includes things like Velociraptor and um, Troodon, things like that. Then Peneraptora is the group of animals that actually have pennaceous feathers. That includes things like Oviraptors. Then you get Manoraptora, which includes things like. Um, uh, Dinochirus and Therizinosaurus, which is an even wider group. And we have Silurosauria, which also includes things like T-Rex and Eutyrannus. And then we have Theropod, which includes things like me. Yep. And the thing is, none of this necessarily has to violate creationism, right? These are all just groups of animals that are grouped together because of obvious similarities and differences with other animals. It's fine. You recognize it for, for mammals. Why not for dinosaurs? The main point here is that those definitions are arbitrary. Yes, yes. Where you put these labels on a tree is arbitrary. These are all names that were made up to describe groups, but the groups exist. This whole thing is just Dr. Haynes saying, well, I don't like which names you put on the tree. Okay. That doesn't mean anything, which means we're going to start skipping because I'm tired of her just complaining, well, well uh, I, don't, I don't like this definition. Great. Yeah. No one cares. It's not there for you. So for definition for so for definition purposes, there we go, is essential to highlight the word bird used here is defined in the classical traditional Linnaean way. Is it? Is it really? Because according to this definition, Archaeopteryx isn't a bird. Again, it's almost like you didn't check on the Linnaean definition. That is having mm. actual modern looking feathers, that's in there. 
It is also necessary to define feathers. Yeah, that's true. It's nice that you recognize that you had to define things. Um, but here's the thing. Carolus Linnaeus, feathers, they're in there, right? It's right here. This is feathers. But um, this other stuff is in here too. You don't get to just skip down to here and be like, oh, this is the one section of, of Linnaeus that counts. Not even the first section. If you're going to pick, I would think that this would be the most important bit. Although, I mean, it would unite uh, birds and mammals together on its own. Mm. So, like, let's get to the first part where it doesn't uh, merge birds and uh, mammals. So, you can actually check mammalia. So, we get the first, this whole first line is the same. Second line is the same. Maxillae. That's where it's different. What's the big thing with bird maxillae? Because we both have incumbentus. But, oh, wait. Beak. Extended. No teeth. Yeah. You don't get to skip that if you're like, I'm going to use the Linnaean classification. All right, fine. And Archaeopteryx isn't a bird. And it still doesn't mean that birds aren't dinosaurs. Because you know who never defined dinosaur? Mm. Linnaeus. Um, so Theros Rex says, where can I find your business uh, advice needed? That you can find on the About uh, tab on my channel page. That is where you can find... 11 already? Holy um, moly. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up pretty soon. Holy moly. Because there's, there's not much else here, right? Um, my business email is a business email, though. So it is, it is not for private communication. And if I feel this is just a warning that I give, right? Like... If I feel like an email needs to go public because, like, you know, there's accusations being made or something, I will make it public. Same goes for my Twitter account. It is a, that is a public-facing professional account for the channel. Uh, Dr. Mark Steele has proposed a new approach to Archaeopteryx in his article in 2001, 2000, sorry, 2021. It's just a new definition of the term bird. The reason for you defining the term bird is because uh, it seems to see that the reports on feathers on other theropods are convincing. Yep. So this is just... Um, Haynes complaining that um, bird uh, dinosaurs with feathers are, are a thing, and she doesn't like it. She doesn't think it's true. Oh, and hey, look, my favorite Avellosaur. Uh, Majungasaurus vertebrae have features that imply the presence of air sacs because of the cavities in them. Yep. Not just the vertebrae either, but yep. This assumption relies on the evolutionary-based interpretation proposed by Bakker. So, so here's the thing, right? How would you know if a fossil bird didn't have those cavities, or sorry, didn't have those air sacs? You check for the cavities, right? The only way you can say that the other things that Paynes thinks are birds are birds and have these air sacs is because she assumes a relationship there, at least in terms of design. You don't get to have that double standard here. If you can assume that these fossil forms had all the bits of bird anatomy that doesn't fossilize directly, Bakker can assume that something else that has the same structures had the same soft tissue underlying that. Sorry. Um, Archaeopteryx bird. Archaeopteryx was first described and classified as a bird by Richard Owen in 1863. Distinctive bird features have been support, have supported this classification in the 12 body specimens of Archaeopteryx. Cool. Science and, didn't stop in 1863. Yep. Archaeopteryx, let's see, Archaeopteryx specimens associated with the feathers except for one. Yep, that's true. But the one that wasn't associated with feathers? Misidentified as the definitely a dinosaur, definitely not a bird, Compsognathus. Uh, let's see. Archaeops feathers, the tooth function, also the morphology of the cranium, inner ears, sclerotic plates. I don't remember Archaeopteryx being preserved with sclerotic plates, but whatever. And the ratio of lower to upper leg are some of the features that uniquely belong to birds that are also present in Archaeopteryx. Well, in offer 2009. Great. None of those are things that make it not a dinosaur. Archaeopteryx has wings arranged with primary and secondary asymmetric feathers, as did dinosaurs that definitely aren't birds, like Oviraptorosaurs. Their macro microstructures are like the feathers and birds we see today. Yep. To provide evidence or provide information and enable us to infer that Archaeopteryx was likely a glider. Yeah, probably. With flat cap capability over short distances. We actually already talked about that. Um, wing bone geometry and subspecies. Spe sorry, specimens of Archaeopteryx. Uh, Archaeopteryx exhibits a combination of cross-sectional geometric properties uniquely shared with volant birds. That means flying birds. Uh, yeah, great. I mean, I'm not here to disagree that Archaeopteryx is... This, though, I do want to talk a little bit about. We're going to open this in a new tab. Nope. Nope. Hey. Go. Here? Hey. Hey. There it is. Oh, goodness, that's big. Okay, so this is range of motion in some 
various groups. So we have Archaeopteryx, Sapiornis, uh, which is an anti ornithine bird, uh, Answer, which is a goose, uh, Opisthocus, which is a juvenile Holotzin, and Struthio, the ostrich. Here's the problem I have with this. This was prepared for this paper, and um, these don't show the fused wing fingers. So right here, Archaeopteryx didn't have fused wing fingers. Sapiornis almost certainly didn't either. But these do. But they're still drawn as separate bones to make it look more like Archaeopteryx just has the same bone arrangement as, say, Struthio. That's not true. Oh. That's a lie. Oh, dear. Yeah, like, the, right here, the, these metacarpals and these uh, carpal bones, or, yeah, no, sorry, not carpal bones, these uh, phalanges, they're fused in the adult. They're separate in the embryo, but they fuse by the time of hatching. All of this fuses. Also, despite the fact that she goes on about, oh, the Hoatzin has claws, um, you know what this is? You know what, you know what this is? Yeah, those are unguals. That's the claw of the goose and the claw of the ostrich. It's not unique to the Hoatzin, and I don't know why people are so up on the Hoatzin having claws, because it's a pretty common thing. But anyway, yeah, so that, that bothers me with this. But also, it's just further evidence that Archaeopteryx is a bird, which, like, okay, I don't dispute. I'm not here to say it's not a bird. The problem is that being a bird doesn't make it not a dinosaur. You've got to show that birds aren't dinosaurs to say that Archaeopteryx being a bird makes it not a dinosaur. But there hasn't even been an attempt. Um... Oh, hey, it was you made using Blender. That's neat. Oh. All right, so here's a skeletal anatomy of Archaeopteryx with the quote-unquote dinosaur pose. And here it is with a quote-unquote bird pose, which I actually don't see as being radically different. I don't, I don't know what I'm you supposed to be taking away. You just made it like the, the phalanges bend downwards instead of that one where one of them bends upwards. Like, right. It's cool. I it's mean, again. literally just a different pose, and I, I don't get what I'm supposed to take away from this. Although I will point out, this is not a Pico style. Nope. It's not a Pico style down here either. So despite the fact that Dr. Haynes is like, oh, Pico style, super important. That's not one of them. Now, this is an interesting one, right? So we have um, in many tetanurans, um, tetanura basically means just stiff tail, and the tail is stiffened by ligaments. And in some later tetanurans, the tail actually stiffens to the point where it's bait past a certain point, it's basically just a rod, and then some of the tendons even start to ossify in the adult form, turn to bone. So here we have actual ego styles, but here, up here, with Archaeopteryx, we don't. This is still a rod-like portion of the tail. This portion of the tail wasn't flexible, but it wasn't merged caudal vertebrae like it is in actual birds. Well, brown birds, say. So, I'll tell you about that one. And I just did it again. I clicked on the picture and I shouldn't have. I don't know how to get out of that. Because this website is poorly formatted. Great. About that time, eh, chaps? So, um, basically, we're just going to skip down to the conclusion. Because it's just a bunch of stuff where Gabriella Haynes is like, look, it's a bird. I'm like, yeah, great. I don't disagree. This is her. Oh, oh look, we got Fiducia in there. Fiducia Allen, 2020, Romancing the Bird and Dinosaurs. Yep. Fiducia should be taken as seriously as uh, Haynes here. Conclusions, here we go. Oh, this is her alternate reconstruction, I guess. Which, hey, Blender once again. Doesn't make it not a dinosaur. Yep. I did it. How did I do it again? Dapper. Sorry. Ugh, I suck at this. Okay, here we go. Um... Creation and secular scientists remain divided on Archaeopteryx's classification. Kind of. Basically, all of real science says it's a dinosaur, and some of real science says it's a bird. As this paper demonstrates, <laughs> the observable data is the same, but the scientists interpret the, that interpret them have different starting, point, starting assumptions. Also, um, there's this thing called verb agreement. This, this is the right here. This is referring to the same uh, them. So the data are the same. Another one of those style bits, right? Data is a plural word. Mm -hmm. They are the same, which is why you're using a plural pronoun here to refer to them. Are. I shouldn't be able to nitpick this paper with the grammar this easily. This is ridiculous. This is what editors are for. Seriously. Andrew Snelling, you're the chief editor. This is your fault. I know you're a, a lying sack of shit. 
But you're also the chief editor. <laughs> Fix this. The Earth creationists believe God created birds and dinosaurs. Okay, True. congratulations. Evolutionists believe that birds and dinosaurs share an ancestry history. Yes. yes. And so what's your point, Vanessa? This is why the interpretations of data are sometimes arrive at opposite conclusions. Still don't know what that means. Attempts to reclassify, redefine, and reinterpret archaeopteryx will not make it become a dinosaur. Literally no one oh is trying God. to do that. A bird will never be a dinosaur. You haven't even Ugh. begun to support that. Uh, birds have distinctive features like feathers, present in lots of non-bird dinosaurs. Arm bone anatomy, which you did kind of lie about earlier, but um, mm -hmm. again, not Pig style, which Archaeopteryx does not have. Mm -hmm. uh, that are irreconcilable to those of dinosaurs. Says who? Just like the modern bird, Watson. I don't know why there's this weird obsession with the stinkiest bird on Earth, which is also, that's true. Watson smell terrible. Oh my god, Jacob, with the Tropic Thunder quote in the chat. Hey! <laughs> I, I don't know, know what it's called. called. I just know the sound it makes when it takes a man's life. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so oh, man. Uh, birds, oh. let's see. Archaeopteryx was created and designed to have the features that did precisely what Archaeopteryx needed. Even if true, doesn't make it not a dinosaur. Some of them might, we might not understand why or how. Okay, but our lack of understanding should not make us surpass biblical limits. Again, you are argument from authority. You have already assumed the conclusion. Also, the Bible's true. Therefore, science must must fit itself to the Bible. No, I want to know what what Bible passage defines dinosaur for me. Nope. Because in order to say that Archaeopteryx being a dinosaur or birds largely being dinosaurs violates biblical limits, you're going to have to show me where the Bible says what a dinosaur is. Pretty sure it God, doesn't. We're clear and definitive. Uh, you, listen, creationists and Christians specifically have a problem with the fact that the Hebrew word is not, the Hebrew language is not based in absolutes and that it can be a lot more wiggly wobbly than you like. They don't like things that aren't absolutes. They have meltdowns. They start shaking and crying. This, this oh, it's is, clear and definitive. No, it's not. This is one of the weirdest arguments. Birds were created on day five and dinosaurs among the land animals on day six. Okay, so day five is the creation of the air and the water animals, right? So if dinosaurs were created on, say, day six with land animals, what about um, whales? Where, where did whales fit in? Were whales on day five or day six? Because they're mammals and mammals are made on day six. I don't know. What about ostriches? They can't fly. Were they created on day five or six? It's almost like the Bible using definitions of how how animals move and where they live versus science making definitions based on things like ancestry and anatomy make it hard to say that whole taxonomic groups are supposed to have been created on a particular day. Now, and the other thing I'm is... Just, and again, I'm going to start going, okay, so are bats birds? I mean, according to the Bible, they are. But again, are bats birds? No. And if she want pick a hill to die on, because if you want to be like, well, Archaeopteryx is a bird, but it's not a dinosaur. Okay, but are bats birds? And also, they fly. What day were they, they made? Live in the sky. What day were they made? Like, come on. God created birds before he created dinosaurs. Not the contrary. Even if you're right about what happened when, God created some dinosaurs before he created other dinosaurs is the conclusion that you can reach there. Wait a minute. Weren't some dinosaurs, didn't some of them live in the ocean? Um, not really. Some of them crossed water occasionally, and some of them lived, okay. uh, like, sort of almost semi-aquatic in terms of, like, living in, like, estuaries and rivers and lagoons and whatnot. But there weren't any okay. really fully aquatic dinosaurs. But the one okay. big problem gotcha. for dinosaurs is they they require a lot of egg care and their eggs can't be held internally because they require oxygen from the outside. Also, if you hold the eggs internally, uh, you have a whole bunch of hard calcium eggshell fragments that are sharp yeah, inside your body. Yeah, not a good idea. Um, there are different kinds. He created on different days the creation week. Great. So yeah, at no point in this paper, which is basically done because now we're at the references, no definition of bird, no definition of dinosaur. The whole thing is worthless from top to bottom. And like I said, hey, Snelling buddy, you're in charge of the editorial staff, which I don't know that it includes anyone but you, but did anyone edit this? 
Probably not. I mean, if they did, they failed in a numerous places. This this is what creationists, well, some creationists, right? There's more than one creationist, quote unquote, journal, right? This is what you're putting forward to the scientific community as your research. This is the science we are producing as young earth creationists. This represents us. We who are here to try to overturn virtually every aspect of every scientific field, which is what's required for young earth creationism to be, tr to be true. You need to overturn virtually all of astronomy, physics, biology, geology, you name it. It's almost certainly wrong if young earth creationism is true. You got to do better. This is abysmal. This only exists so that your pet paleontologist can say, well, I'm publishing papers in creation science that doesn't do any science and doesn't even do the yeah, basic logic. Yeah, I was going to say, show me where the science is. Right. So just do better. This is, this is pathetic. It's not even an attempt to actually say that Archaeopteryx is a bird and that birds aren't dinosaurs. You didn't do the first thing that you need to do. You didn't even cite well, some a people, definition. Some people disagree on it, okay? And, yep. again, what's your point? And if none you of the people... have a case to make, make the case. None of the people who are classifying it as various groups of dinosaurs that are outside of uh, Aviale made the case that birds aren't dinosaurs, or, and none of the people who were classifying, classifying it in Aviale tried to make the case that made it not a dinosaur either. So you're citing a whole bunch of people who all say Archaeopteryx is a dinosaur, saying, see... They disagree about whether it's a dinosaur. No, no, they don't. So this is... Look, Dr. Haynes, if you ever watch this, I haven't been very kind to you in this, this live, or this stream, right? It's not because I think you're a terrible person. What I want is for creationists to do better science, because right now, if this is what you're presenting to the world, it's laughable just from a basic logical standpoint. And look, I don't think it's your fault that you have some of these editing errors, right? English isn't your first language. And even people who are native English speakers, there's a lot of rules to remember with like formal writing and formatting and where what gets italicized and what doesn't and all that stuff, right? That's fine. But basic logic. Have the basic logic down. If you're going to tell me Archaeopteryx is a bird and birds aren't dinosaurs, the form that that takes is, here is definition for dinosaur, here is definition for bird. You cited only one definition for bird, and it's one that violates the idea that Archaeopteryx is a bird in the first place. Did you look it up? Did you check Linnaeus? No, you couldn't have. Or you're lying. Those are the only options. So... Guys, do better. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I really appreciate it. We're going to quickly go through. Vishanti, I'm assuming you don't have an ETA on your next video. <laughs> I thought about editing it this week. Oh. Does that count? <laughs> I mean, it's not an ETA, but it's it's thinking about progress, which is more yes. than not thinking about progress. So good job. Yay. Okay. Uh, guys, uh, Tuesday, Jackson with Jackson. You can find it in my upcoming streams tab on my channel page. Um... The, uh, let's see, the 29th will be, um, the, what's that pastor's name? Um, the one who, you know what, I'll just check. I, I have my channel up right here. I can just look about being dumb. Um, <laughs> so give me a second. Let's see. Content. There we go. Uh, yeah, so this is the pastor. It's Carl... Carl Kirby. Carl Kirby is the name of the pastor. Uh, he is going to show up, show us how little he understands primates. And then that's going to be part one of two. And the second part is going to be him showing us how little he understands specifically hominins. Um, so that's what's coming up on that Thursday. Then that Saturday, who knows? What is that going to be the first? Um, there will probably be something. There almost always is. Um, so, guys, thank you very much. Um, oh, also, uh, Tuesday the 4th, Antoven is going to be wearing his tutu. Nice. So, look forward to that. And that is because you guys got a one stream, like, super chat goal. So, mm -hmm. if, one, if one stream gets $200, Antoven puts on a tutu for the next time. So, I mean, technically, you guys could make the tutu a permanent fixture. 
if you want to be extremely generous, which I don't expect. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, we're going to get out of here. Stay safe out there. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knopf, 252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mavity Bavity, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.